Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar. This webinar uh, was partially set up uh, in cooperation with um, Glenn Whittingham, House of Fern, and he's on the line with me now. So I'm just going to get him to say a few words about this. He's got a number of his people that uh, are being introduced to this through the webinar. So, uh, Glenn, if you just want to say hi and and uh, introduce whatever you want to introduce. Yes, um, <clears throat> I um, met um, JD, we'll call him JD, he'll explain why. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I met him, um, it was about a month or two ago in uh, Vancouver, um, and um, he had this uh, privateperson.com website, and um, I've always, you know, said to stay away from the idea of being a person. And uh, uh, although technically the, the court citations that I read basically say that uh, that uh, 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 a sovereign's not a person as far as a statute is concerned, which is very complementary to his website. He's got some great material um, uh, about this private person, uh, and I've actually started to incorporate it into my uh, my material. And so I would uh, highly recommend that everybody take a look at this because. Um, I think this, uh, you know, the courts operate in the fiction, and 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 if you don't go in there as a person, they won't even recognize you, and uh, so you have to. There's got to be a way of going in there as a person, um, and yet not be subject to some statute at common law, essentially, and uh, and this allows that. And so uh, I'll uh, turn the time back over to JD, and uh, and uh, he'll go through and explain this a lot better for you. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, the, the main reason that I wanted to do this, I've, I do have an intro to a private person on the website already. Uh, it was one I just recorded on my desktop, and I wanted to revisit the whole concept as an introductory concept, very simplified to two main issues. The fact that person isn't necessarily always a bad thing, and the existence of the term private person, what it is in law, how it works, and how we might want to revisit it, because so many people literally around the world who are studying this information have avoided the use of the word person entirely. And I think that's to our detriment. So my goal here, as I'll get into, is uh, to revisit that concept with everybody. Before we get started, I've got a couple of polls which are question and answer I'd like you to participate in during the, during the webinar here. Um, the first one is uh, just about to show up on your screen. You have uh, a question and then uh, you have uh, four potential answers and if you can just have a look at that and click on the answer that uh, suits you right now what is your personal belief uh, about it and uh, just click on that in terms of your understanding of the word person right now I'll cut it off there 75 percent of you have voted I'm gonna share the results so that you can see it on your screen 13 percent of you right now have a belief that it's danger danger avoid and I understand that I get that there's so many people teaching that's uh, the way it is and that's uh, it's great that you're here to listen to it again and revisit it and uh, and reconsider it at least 29 percent I'm not a person you can't make me <laughs> again just slightly this side of danger danger avoid um, and I think there's some crossover with the human rights people are teaching about I'm a human being and I'm a man on the land and all that sort of stuff uh, there's some crossover beliefs into that. What's the big deal? 10%. Um, again, uh, not as many there. 56. I choose always to be a private person. Well, that's pretty good, which means a lot of you have visited the site and uh, maybe have done your own research as well. So uh, thanks for participating in that. That's great. We'll have a couple more of those um, going on and uh, later on in the in the webinar. So just a, a brief introduction. Uh, many of you aren't familiar uh, with me. I've been teaching this type of material for over a decade now in the Vancouver area and uh, across Canada to uh, a lot of people. But um, when I get introduced to another, another teacher of material, I obviously get introduced to a new, new group of people who aren't familiar with me. And I use man throughout the presentation, so if there are any uh, women uh, online and listening on the replay, it's a generic term. And this is one of the key principles we need to consider is that we're not going to argue about any words at the moment. We're looking at the spirit or the principle behind the word rather than the legal world's interpretation of it, which most people believe is the only one that we're bound to, etc. And that's not necessarily the case, so it's a good thing to reconsider that whole concept. Words mean what we intend and agree them to mean. So when I use a word, I have my own definition, my own understanding, 
And just like in a contract where you have a word definition section, or in statutes you have a word definition section, the parties who are talking about it need to agree on the meaning of the words. And that's a, a, a valuable principle to consider. So who is JD? Some guy who likes privacy and he is no guru. I um, am not uh, going public with my name. The system knows entirely who I am. They've been on my case for over a decade now. Uh, it's not a matter of hiding from the system. It's just I don't want to be uh, out in the public uh, at, at this point anyways. Uh, lifelong entrepreneur, student and facilitator. Done a lot of teaching and instructing in various types of um, training. Uh, I've had over five years of my own personal court experiences going into Provincial Court of British Columbia, Supreme Court of British Columbia, um, BC Court of Appeal. I've watched court cases go on for over 14 years, um, 22 years of uh, material studied on variety of freedom info, uh, personal development, etc. And um, uh, JD is an AKA. And it, for me, it represents the, the name John Doe. And John Doe is the name that is a label given to one with no name. So when the system doesn't know your name, they label that individual John Doe. So I like that type of association because I really don't want to be recognized by their particular system. And I'm sharing my personal experience and opinion only. Um, there is no legal advice. It's just my research. Uh, and my understanding, interpretation, what I've researched, and it's also my personal observations through reading uh, case law, through uh, watching judges in court, talking to lawyers, uh, wat watching and listening to lots and lots of researchers out there. Just to give you an idea, this is just a list of some of the researchers that I've studied over the years, and when I say study, I'm not just saying watched once, I've watched uh, hours of their material done confirmations and many of them I've had uh, personal conversations with and so on. Uh, there's so many sources of information that uh, you can spend a whole lot of time. My goal with my research is to take whatever I've learned from wherever and try and condense it down to the principles, the key ideas, so that we're not spending time arguing about details but the basic concept of the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law. And I'm looking at the spirit of the law, which is not the way the system presently functions. It doesn't mean that that's not the way it can't function if we actually uh, learn how to operate the system correctly. Of my studies to date so far. The basic premise that I'm going to be covering today in terms of uh, my conclusions that I've already made to that I want to put out there that this is the direction I'm going with the information I'm going to cover tonight. So it's um, uh, kind of laying a bit of a background on the perspective I bring to the, the details that we're going to be covering here. That the common law protects you already. We, I live in common law British Columbia and common law Canada except of course for Quebec which is uh, civil law. So the basic foundation of common law is there. It's recognized throughout the law. The judges speak to it all the time. You can find it referred over and over and over throughout uh, uh, all legal uh, materials. And many people go, well, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. They don't recognize it. Well, they do. They don't play the game that way right now, but they do recognize it because they have to. It's the foundation. The foundation is sound, but has been taken over, covered up, and hidden from sight. They don't want you in common law, and they're doing everything they can to keep you out of it. They're hiding it from you, they'll play games with you, they'll trick you, etc. Um, because a duplicate mirror world of law exists. They have created something that looks like a proper legal system, but is not. So when I walk into court the first time, I assumed I was going to be treated honorably. I assumed I was going to be dealing with common law because that was my understanding of the law. And uh, they're playing a whole different game and they don't tell you. So they've created this whole second reality which they invite us to come into without our knowledge and understanding and they manipulate us with the uh, assumed consent of it. So we need to know the why and how of the common law system as it's supposed to be working and I think we intuitively understand it and the why and how of how they trick us into it. Now remember this is an intro so I'm going to be covering some basic stuff but the material I'm covering as I go through it is going to again put a twist possibly on the, your understanding that you've had until now. You really are the power when you are in honor and that is again the foundation of law is that it's it's the man, the private person that is the power in law and we have uh, the opportunity to exist that power when we deal with the system in an honorable fashion 
and we recognize our power in it and we hold them to account to it. But we need to understand what that power is. Hold those manipulating the law to account for their manipulations. At some point in time, this is where we need to go. This is the process that needs to happen is that there needs to be accountability. And there is accountability coming into the system slowly, slowly, slowly in places you can see it. Um, and that they self-cure. When you point it out, they will hold themselves to account. And it, it just has to be pointed out to them in a way where they are, you know, going to hold themselves to account. So my basic premise is that private person is the high status that you want to claim. Now you don't have to agree with me now, that's not the point. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I just want you to revisit this concept if you haven't, introduce you to it if you haven't been exposed to it, do your investigation, do your research, and if you decide that that makes sense to you after you've convinced yourself, then wonderful. And if not, that's wonderful too. But this is the cl conclusion that I have come to. All right. Now, <clears throat> my goal here, like I said, is to get you to reconsider person as a legal concept because that is a big part of how their game is structured and introduce private, private person as the primary person of power in law. The private person must exist first for any other person to exist in law because every other person is a derivative of the private person is part of my conclusion. The whole stance that people have with regards to the fact that I'm not a person, again, I understand that. And I had my own questions based on all the material out there for a long time. But the very first thing that I did when I went to court, uh, I was charged with failing to comply with the notice to file my taxes in 1998. And the very first question I asked was with regards to status and the capitus of the name on the summons. And uh, we you know, rolled down the merry road uh, from that point forward. And so person and, and the natural person and the status has been the, my first uh, curiosity and question from the very beginning. Is person bad really? Like what is a person rather than, you know, the way it's been taught or perceived by some other people? Why is the system afraid of private person? And when I use private person, there is a correlation to natural person. And we'll get into that more and it do cover it on the website in great depth. But natural person is synonymous with private person in the common law. And again, we'll get more to that later. Why are they afraid of it if I raise natural person or if I raise natural person where they actually go on the high threat mode because you've done it? And what do the dictionaries really say? A number of people teaching about person and, and natural person, etc. There'll be four definitions and they'll pull one definition out and say, see, see, it's this. Well, what about the other three definitions? Because it's context. Everything changes based on context. What is the law built on? Is it built on the living or the dead? Now the Roman civil law system is based on dead entities, uh, persons uh, that are corporations, etc, etc. But every entity must be created by the living first. And the common law is about the, the living and the civil law, Roman civil law, is about the dead. And so in order for you to create those corporations, you need the living person in order to uh, create the dead. So the living must come first, and it must continue to exist for the quote-unquote dead to exist, which is kind of funny. And I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, it's a concept I've had in my mind for a while, all these zombie movies. You know, like I think that really it's a, it's a good analogy for most people out there is they are the living dead. They exist in a civil law society as dead entities, as far as the system is concerned, legally speaking, but they have an element of life. They have no consciousness or ability to think for themselves. And there was a recent new movie that was kind of a, a love story of a, of a zombie who wakes up from the near-dead experience and he becomes living again and all the zombies start to wake up again. And it, it might be a story about society starting to wake up from the living dead civil law system. So effectively, we're only going to talk about common law, and I'm going to abbreviate with the initial CL and Roman civil law as RCL throughout the um, presentation. These are the two main systems that we're dealing with. Um, there are other legal systems out there, but uh, these are the two that we're going to be talking about. And uh, capitus and status. Capitus uh, diminutio is one of the uh, Roman civil law terms with regards to the capitalization of the name. Most people have been introduced to it. Most people have no concept of what it really means. They've only been told uh, one interpretation, half an interpretation. 
the status issue is uh, key to everything uh, that I do. And this term, this phrase, that people go, it's spelled in all capital letters. This drives me nuts. I've heard people say this for ever, and I hear people saying it today, and I correct everybody at all times whenever I hear them say it. It is not spelling when you talk about capitalization. It is style. Style, style, style. Spelling is which letter you choose, and style is how that letter is represented in a small or a uh, capitalized version. And so whenever you use the wrong phrase to describe something, then the courts and the, and the, the uh, lawyers get uh, grays, gray areas to manipulate their words. I was in court one day and I asked the judge if uh, they could ask the Crown to change the um, style of the name on the information. And uh, the judge turned to the Crown and said, would you be willing to change the spelling of the name on the information? And the Crown just kind of smiled and said, no, we're fine with it the way it is. And I didn't catch it at the moment. But when I revisited uh, the conversation in the transcripts, I looked at it and the judge had changed my request from changing the style to changing the spelling. And that's a totally different request. And it's a totally different issue. So when you use the wrong uh, phrase, definition, word to describe what it is that you want, you give them an opportunity to wiggle out of what you're doing. And for a full description of capitus and other issues, Do Common Law Courts Exist course is on uh, private-person.com website. It's there available free for members. There are many hours of uh, material covering the basic principles of common law courts. Do they exist and how they get you there and all that sort of stuff. So again, that's where to go for more um, information and proof on it. The whole idea of I'm not a person comes down to status versus capacity. And many people are confused about the distinction between the two and aren't even aware that there is a distinction. The status is uh, different than capacity. And status is what you are relative to the game. And the Roman civil law defines it as your condition in law, at law. Status really is who you are in the game versus capacity, which is what you can do in the game. Now, when you are given a certain status, you're given certain capacities to uh, do certain things. The status, in most cases, is defined or excuse me, the capacities in most cases are defined by the status. Capacity is a derivative of status. Status comes first. You can't play the game without status. And this is uh, going along the lines what um, uh, Glenn referred to at the beginning, at the intro, was you need to be recognized in the legal system. And that is status. If you're not a player in the game with status, they can't see you, they can't hear you. And I, I've witnessed this in court in a couple of different uh, uh, ways that uh, you have to be a person at common law to have your rights upheld. You have to be a person in the civil law in order to have your rights upheld and, and the obligations to kick in, etc. You can't play, they can't see you. Uh, anything you do without having status in their game means that you're not there. You either have standing in law or you're an outlaw. You're outside the law. And one of the things I like about talking with uh, other people about this stuff is, um, you know, you get feedback, you get questions, you come up with new ideas and clarifying stories, etc. And in conversation with Glenn, he goes, well, yeah, just like, you know, in the, in the Old West, you know, the, if, somebody, if, the, if the outlaws came into town and killed somebody, what would they do? They'd go get a posse to try and get the outlaws to hold them account to the law. And that is the protection that is afforded to you. Well, uh, it is my understanding that status has to do uh, with Roman civil law, though. I mean, uh, it's clear that uh, Roman civil law has uh, status is very important in Roman civil law. But in common law, everybody's sovereign. And so uh, status doesn't mean anything in common law. Right. I'm correct. Absolutely. But what you're, de you're dealing with the fact that... When, because you're coming into their system, which they operate as a Roman civil law system, they have to recognize that you're a status outside of the Roman civil law. So unless you declare your status outside of the Roman civil law, then as far as they're concerned, you're inside it. That's the default. So private person is a status they recognize, and they go, oh, that's outside of Roman civil law. So it is a form of status within, uh, within the legal system. All right, and because again, we'll get more into that later, but it's a fine line. Um, but it's the principle of uh, of the fact that you have to have standing and you have to uh, be recognized by the courts.
Another distinction, again, uh, n not many things that I'll say, especially when you're trying to bring things from memory and put things into words, it's difficult to get the exact word sometimes and you're trying to express a principle. As I mentioned, the word um, may not be perfect, but the principle being described, sometimes difficult to uh, get clear, and everybody's got a different definition of it. So my understanding and the way that I describe this to myself is that all law is fiction. Common law is a fiction, all right? And, it, I mean, nowhere is there, you know, some law that's just there for everybody. It's a set of law, it's a set of agreed-to rules. And any time you have an agreed-to set of rules by, by men, you have a fiction because you can change those rules, you can change those understandings, etc. And, uh, you know, even the law of nature, um, that's pretty well defined because you can observe it, but even there, there's arguments about it, etc. And we're not going to get into the um, uh, the religious or theological perspective right now. We're just looking at the legal systems that we're dealing with on a daily basis with regards to uh, the common law and the uh, Roman civil law structures at the moment. They're made by man. Therefore, they're changeable. They're flexible. They grow over time. So it's like sitting down to a game. And if the rules are written down on the, you know the cardboard box inside lid, then everybody knows what they are. And what they've done is they've sat us down at a game and we don't know where the rules are and we are assuming that the rules are a certain way. They've made them, they can change them, especially in Roman civil law, whereas the principles of um, common law are less changeable because they're principle-based. As soon as you codify, write things down uh, to such a degree that it's all in code, now it comes down to interpretations. It comes down to letter of the law stuff versus spirit of the law stuff. That's why the common law is an unwritten um, law because it's the principles that underline right living versus, you know, how do we define this word and in this context and let's all argue about it and make lots of money. The general principle of common law was to create a safe, healthy uh, societal structure that allowed uh, protections for the group and some obligations uh, to, to the group for the purpose of maintaining that self-healthy societal structure. Have we gotten away from that? Absolutely. Can we get back to it? Goodness knows, I don't know. Uh, the Jew rules are generally good as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I've studied the court rules, I've studied the court regulations, they make sense. There's a flow to it. They're dealing with situations that are going to come up over and over, so you might as well have a set of rules to guide people. And it's complex because you're looking at it as a whole. And if you break it down and look at chunks, you look at ideas and concepts in those rules, you'll find out they make sense almost all the time. Lawyers and crooks twist and break the rules because they're pointing to the letter of the law and they're going, well, what does this mean, etc. And they're interpreting and creating arguments that don't need to exist. It's the way it's being manipulated versus the fact that it's there, I think, is the is issue. Uh, history of man. I, I would like that. Hmm? I would like to add in here about these rules <clears throat> is that, uh, in my opinion, they have way too many rules. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a problem with rules per se, but, uh, you know, when they have a thousand pages worth of rules, uh, uh, that's way too many. Uh, it should be short, it should be uh, uh, brief, uh, and, and I think that that's one of the sources of corruption. They use their rules against you and they deprive you of justice because of their rules. Yes, but um, you, you'll find most of the actual, I'm talking more reference to the court rules, and you'll find that the court rules and the principles of uh, process are relatively straightforward. Um, have they been manipulated? Sure, but the large percentage of them I have found to be reasonable in my jurisdiction anyways. I don't know yeah. about every jurisdiction. But once you get into Roman civil law, then you're into a whole different set of rules and you're holding a whole different set of conditions and, and confusions because that's the nature of Roman civil law. Um, so, yes, I agree with you. It's uh, gotten out of hand. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons that they have so many rules is because it is. Absolutely. The more gray areas, the more confusing, the more you need an expert to interpret it, the more power they have and the less power you have. That is absolutely part of the structure for sure. Person is a mask. We've all heard that, right? They create the person, so they own me. These are questions that have been taught uh, to people. I'm a human being, not a person. Uh, there's a distinction there, which I think is... Um, confusing. Uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone is entitled to be recognized as a person. And uh, that is um, 
again, there's a principle being expressed there. It's not to force you into something where you're giving up your rights. It's to um, uh, allow you to be recognized in a legal system where there are protections when in certain societies where you're, you're outside the law, you have no rights and you have no protections. And so again, there's, a, there's an element of um, legitimacy to it that's just been turned into something uh, negative. The 1928 persons case uh, where women became persons, this was in Canada. So before 1928, women were not persons in law uh, and there was a case where they went to um, the Supreme Court of Canada and they got turned down and said, no, they're not persons in law. And at that time, the highest court was to go to the Privy Council in England and they uh, made a ruling that women were persons in law and then were able to be elected to the Senate. And that was the reason for that particular case. So when you think about the fact the law can change where one day uh, women are not a person and the next day women are a person, has anything really changed with regards to the human being? No, nothing. But their ability to step into the game and play in the legal world, if they choose to, has now been open to them. And it's not a recognition of the fact they're not a natural person or a private person or a human being. It's the fact they've been given permission to play in the legal world where they weren't allowed to play before. And that's, a, that's an important distinction to make. Now, this is probably... If you're not watching the screen right now, you really should because this is probably the most exciting, dramatic, educational moment of this entire presentation. And of course, I'm slightly humorous because I worked on this a few minutes, so watch the entertainment. This for me is a really brief outline of how laws progressed. It went from basically having warrior kings going conquering, wiping out, and enslaving populations and uh, and then their law, what they say is the law. That's how the law was set. And it was, you know, iron fist military control. And then they kind of went off the scene and we ended up with all of these different monarchies and we had the kings and queens and various other things. Uh, and I'm skipping a few, but these are just the big ones. And uh, it became what the king said based on, the king or queen based on divine uh, rule. They were, you know, appointed by the, the divine, by God, in order to make the rules, and there they were, you know, unimpeachable. What they said was uh, all good and everything else. And so we've gone through this process of having ruled um, where we have uh, built up a society. We come out and we develop through uh, the process of being enslaved from military rulers to being somewhat enslaved in the same way by the um, uh, uh, monarchies. And then common law develops out of that and replaces a lot of the protections and a lot of the processes that the monarchy used to do. And now the monarch was now bound by some of the rules as well. So there's been this progression. The problem is that they also then created all these different other forms of law. The Roman civil law is a carryover from before the common law. Trust law created, admiralty law, etc. And more and more and more laws. And each one of those is a different place in the world. Common law is about the people. It's about principles. And it's, it's grassroots, grassroots movements, uh, uh, underground economies. Wh what is the underground? The underground is the earth. Where do the people come from? Our bodies are made up of the elements of the earth and, uh, you know, imbued with the spirit, right? So we have this concept of we can exist at common law on the land, and we can also step into any of these buildings which they have created for us to go and play in, each one of them being a different type of law. Now, some of them we go into willingly. Most of them we go into because we've been deceived into it. We don't realize we're walking off the land and into one of their legal systems. And then we lose the basic principles of our protections and our rights at common law. The idea is not to get sucked into these buildings of confusing rules, regulations, interpretations, gray areas, etc., where they can change the rules anyway, but to stay at common law. That's my personal goal. Now, um, this is an interesting dynamic when you think about it. In North America, we all used to be living on the land, farmers, and now everybody's congregated into these cities, and there's very few people left on the land. And what's in the city is lots of high-rise buildings, right? So they've taken us further away from the land and into their artificial worlds and into their artificial uh, fictional games, etc. And we need to get back to the land. We need to get back to common law. And this is a distinction and a difference from the free man on the land concept. That's not what I'm referring to. So enter at your own risk. 
into all of these things. And when somebody invites you into one of them, be very careful and check it out. So here's the person's case, 1929. All right. It was um, in 1929, the Privy Council declared women are indeed persons. Well, again, when you're talking about in the world of law, by the definition of words in the legal dictionaries, they have a unique definition for what a person is. We're not talking about a human being. We're not talking about that. We're talking about legal status, legal standing to play in the world of law. And I've got a good little teaching uh, clip on the uh, website with regards to what dictionaries are, how they work, why you need to understand them, because they act as if the normal and everyday meaning of words is applicable. And then they go and they use one of their legal definitions of it without telling us. So they're playing, again, word magic with regards to that. So know who you are. I've heard this over the years, and a lot of people go, what the heck does that mean? Right? Well, this is again what I'm talking about with private person, and we'll get into that as to how it all works. A man in common law equals a private person. If you are a man or a woman and you want to exist in the common law and be recognized in the common law, this is how you are now recognized by the system through statutes and through everything else. This is the term they use to describe a man in the legal system with the rights and the duties that attach to that particular status. That's a private person. A private person is a mask for the man because a man doesn't exist and has no standing in the courts and at law you have to accept the position in society of, of private person in order to um, have the standing and have the protections and so on. So yes, it is a form of a mask. And it's a small trade-off for the protections as far as I'm concerned. Big question, is private person a creation of statute? No, I haven't been able to find any, any evidence that it's a creation of statute. It exists, it is recognized by the law, it is not created by their legal system. And that's a big difference. And I was just in court on Friday and I heard the judge say that the charter and rights, the, 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 the rights that the, that the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms grants you, yada, 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 and my brain's going just a second here. The charter doesn't grant anything. That's not what it's there for. That's not how it works. But that is the sales pitch that the system wants to, you to believe that they have granted you something. And the charter only offers you a vehicle to protect the rights you already have uh, when you want to hold the system to account for infringing your rights. It grants nothing. And uh, that's the distinction between they want you to believe they have created you and then they control you and they have a say in it. And it's the exact reverse. We have created them. Private person is the foundation of all common law. Everything comes from the private person. Without the private person, you can't imbue energy into any of the other creations. You are the power delegating your power down. Every office Every municipal um, uh, official, every provincial official, every uh, federal official, those are offices in law that only exist because private persons have created that office and put people into those offices that then take that uh, power. So it's the context. Everything is about context. Uh, you need to understand, are you talking about the real world plain English? Are you talking about the common law principle and uh, legal interpretation of the words and the terms and the conditions? Or are you talking about the civil law version? Or are you talking about the admiralty law version? So people mix a lot of this. And when I hear people quoting maxims, legal maxims, they'll say, well, this maxim is, you know, it's a maxim. It's true. Well, just a second. What type of maxim is it? Is it a commercial maxim? Is it a common law maxim? Is it an equity maxim? Because if you try and bring the, a maxim from a different form of law into the one you want, it's not going to work. It doesn't necessarily bridge the gap. So you have to be very careful of the context. So a private person, and this is a distinction that I made many years ago. I'm teaching for a long time. It's already on the website, but I'm going to cover it very, very quickly. A private person, when they are of full capacity, that means that you have the mental ability to uh, make decisions, etc. There's a certain age that uh, is... Um, deemed to be of full capacity at different legal systems, usually 18, 19, 21, depending on the jurisdiction. When you're full capacity, the law deems you to have the ability to demonstrate full knowledge. You understand how the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior, and you can make that decision. And uh, you have the mental capacity to do it. You also are deemed to have full responsibility 
You're responsible for your actions, which means you can be taken to court, prosecuted, sued, etc., for the actions you take. And the court deems you to be liable, which means they're going to make you pay if you uh, act in a way that causes harm to another person. And this is just based on, uh, there is no case law that I've seen with regards to this, but just plain simple deduction. When you get 18, they say, now you're an adult, now you're reliable for your own actions and responsible. This is what they mean. They've assumed you've come to a position where you're smart enough, you've got enough life experience, you know right from wrong, and now you're responsible and liable for your actions. Because up until then, your parents are responsible and liable for your actions. At least that's the way it used to be. So can you see how most people may not qualify to be a private person of full capacity? Because they demonstrate they don't understand. They demonstrate irresponsible behavior and they demonstrate unwillingness to take liability. And as soon as you, they can see those actions from you, they, you're inviting the powers that be to protect and control you. Invoke parents patre or um, uh, any other form of control. They're looking for an excuse to point their finger at you and say, you don't understand, you're not responsible, you're not liable, therefore we get to take control of your life. Okay? So this is a foundational concept with regards to what capacity is. Your actions speak louder than words and dead paper. In court one day, I walked in and I says, here's an affidavit. I didn't have time to get it notarized. Will you accept my affidavit as if it was sworn? And the judge said, yes, I'll accept your affidavit as sworn. Because I'm standing there, I don't have to have a piece of paper. I can address it uh, myself. And if he has any questions, I'm right there. The man, the living, will always be superior to the paper. And I've also presented paperwork, and the judge just looks at it and goes, yeah, okay, well, tell me what it, what's in it. He wants to know if I understand what's in that document, rather than maybe somebody outside the courtroom wrote it for me, and I don't understand it. So it's a knowledge test, all right? So uh, they do need to have you express yourself in your own words. The idea of jurisdiction is the first thing in every case. I've just been uh, in court a number of days with regards to a preliminary trial uh, hearing for a uh, tax evasion case, and uh, jurisdiction is the number one thing that they have to establish in order to have any type of hearing. And my focus with uh, helping people with court stuff is the very first thing you focus on is jurisdiction. Do they have standing to make the claim they're making? And what is the claim that they're making? Because jurisdiction is the right, a power, or authority, or the law which is speaking to you. They're claiming jurisdiction over you and what you do to bring their claim to court. The judge is claiming jurisdiction to make a decision about the parties before him. Whether or not that's true or not is a secondary issue, but that's generally how they play it. It's primary and foundational for everything. If you get into arguing details, you've admitted they, they have jurisdiction to bring you there, and the judge has jurisdiction to hear it. First place to start is do they have jurisdiction to make their claims? So you claim, you question, you claim your status is my position. You question the, the, the status and other issues that they're bringing to court, and you deny consent to be taken to any other court. And I'm going to give a case example later on where I was in court just a month and a half ago, and this is the basic process, and I'll describe it to you uh, more fully a little bit later on. But do not consent to anything other than common law jurisdiction. And because they presume it, if you specifically deny it, they might have a problem moving forward. And it appears they do. They have the burden of proof. The claiming party has the burden of proof. And so you don't have to admit anything. You don't have to provide any evidence. Your entire case could be challenging their standing, again, which is my position. They must prove standing when challenged. If you don't challenge it, it's presumed to be valid. And so it's a really good thing to challenge it. Now, symbols of power are an important thing to recognize because Capitus Diminutio, uh, in terms of the style of the name, is a symbol of power. The law of flags uh, is important distinction with regards to the jurisdiction. This goes to stationery when they send you a letter. This goes to a, a flag in a courtroom or a coat of arms in a courtroom. They are communicating with symbols all the time. Their symbols are telling you where you are and who they are. And if you don't know what their symbols say, what they mean, then you may be, you know, participating in something that you don't really want to participate in. All occult sciences use symbols. And occult just means hidden, which means they're not going to disclose it to you. So if you're into their, you know, court occult stuff, 
you better understand some of their symbols. And every symbol has a defined meaning and a message. If you don't get the meaning and the message, you may miss what's going on. So there's some very basic stuff to understand with regards to that. And symbols are a language. They're communicating and advertising all the time to those who understand this is who we are, this is what's going on, I've given you notice. And if you didn't uh, object to it, then I guess uh, you know I don't have to do anything else. Again, it's trickery, but that's how they play the game. The documents that they use, how they, how they structure them, the courtrooms, the flags, even the websites are advertising. And I'll show you that uh, shortly. Uh, who's in control, uh, what law is in place, and so on. So for me, everything really comes down to the real versus the fiction. Uh, and a lot of people are going, I'm a human, I'm a man, I'm real, everything you're doing is a fiction. And they're, they're, they're you know, fighting and running away from they see everything as a fiction without recognizing that there are elements of the court that are real as well. There has to be. Because the fiction courts have to be built on top of the real courts in order for them to exist. So there may just be a real court there that we want to uh, access. A corporation cannot be created without a natural person making the application. And, uh, you know, that's just, again, if they take an, a natural person status of individual, private person, in order to create these things. Common law known as a private person. And this is where we get into bi-jural terminology to create the distinction between natural person and private person. The, um, in, at Roman civil law, a man is referred to as a natural person. That's what it is in Quebec. That's what it is in international uh, court uh, in, um, in The Hague. They refer to the natural person because they're dealing with legal systems from around the world. The bi-jural means two jurisdictions. And what they've done is they said we've got common law, and we've got civil civil law. And private person does not exist in Roman civil law. But natural person can exist in common law. So because we're dealing with two different jurisdictions and we have to communicate with both of them, let's use a, for, let's use a term that both systems can use. And Roman civil law is a top-down authority. They make the rules, they write the code, and you obey them. And uh, common law is a people-up authority. The people are the foundational power and the foundational authority. They're giving their power to officers to execute in a trust manner on their behalf. And their failure to do that is where we need to hold them to account. And here's an, uh, an example of the bi-jural terminology program from Department of Justice Canada. Now, the phrase here is common law. Now, their problem was we have, Bur we have Quebec, which is uh, civil law, and we have the rest of Canada is common law. We're a federal government that has to write federal laws that have to apply to both jurisdictions. How do we do that with the language that both jurisdictions can understand because it's possible to exist in both jurisdictions? So they've gone through and they've changed words in the acts in order to make them effective in both jurisdictions. So... This was with regards to the Federal Real Property Act. They went through every la act and every line looking for problems. The provision, they used to say, real property may be transferred by a private person. The problem is that the terms private person and the French version of it are foreign to civil law, do not exist, is not recognized, which uses the term person physique instead, conveyed in most cases, most cases, not all cases, by natural person in English. Well, like I said, I want to be a private person at common law. I don't want to be a natural person who may be confused with the civil law variety. Although there is a Federal Interpretation Act rule that says if you're at common law, the common law definition of the word is supposed to apply. It doesn't necessarily mean they do that. So what they did was they took this provision, number five, and they rewrote it to, to change the word to natural person from private person. So private person was removed from many of the federal uh, uh, laws in order to make that particular law work legally in both jurisdictions. But I say in most federal laws, not all federal laws. Here's another term, the word person. Common law and civil law, the same word. Problem, the term private person used in English version is obsolete. Now this may be confusing to some. What do you mean obsolete? Doesn't exist anymore? Obsolete. Look up the definition of obsolete. It just means we don't use it anymore, right? Curious thing is that they took the provision, any person, 
and this provision, private person of full age and capacity. And they changed out anyone with any person, and they changed out private person of full age and capacity with the term person. Now there's a fairly big shift there, because person has multiple meanings and multiple definitions. And there's a big shift between private person of full age and capacity and person. But if they're saying here that private person is obsolete, that should mean that it will never be seen again because it's not used. And that's just not true. It's still used in federal uh, laws in certain places. Remember the term, most cases, in most cases? Because they have to use it where it only exists at common law and is not applicable to civil law. So you will find instances still of the use of the term private person even though this section says it's obsolete. This is uh, the bi-jural terminology record. This is a newer version of it. And uh, one of the ways to look at this, common law, rights, powers, and privileges of a natural person. What's happened is that uh, about six years ago or so, eight, seven years ago or so, the municipalities started giving, the, the provincial provinces started giving municipalities the rights, powers, and privileges of a natural person, which they did not have before. And this has, again, created a lot of confusion for people. How can they be people? They're not people. Well, they're not. They're just being given additional to their described ones in the Act, rights, powers, and privileges of a natural person, because they don't have it to begin with. They have to be given those rights, powers, and privileges by their creator, creator which is the province. But those rights, powers, and privileges are subject to this Act. And many times when people will read something like this, they'll miss this type of phrase here. There's always an if but. And uh, this is the big uh, if but. So in civil law, a corporation that has a capacity of natural person, that has. That means some do, some don't. It has to have been given to them by their creator, the, the state that wrote the law. Right? The capacity of a natural person has the full enjoyment of its rights just like a human being. Well, that's the idea here is not that they are human beings, but that they have been given some of the additional rights human beings already have that they did not have at their creation and have to be specifically given as an additional thing. And look at the difference here between civil law and common law. There are different problems in the different laws. In law and law, to ensure that a corporation could exercise all of its rights, the words uh, wording rights, powers, and privileges of a natural person or wording similar to that must be used. So they created the solution, the harmonized version. And this is for the French. Harmonized version in French is the only one that changed. So you can see they've gone through this, power, this process of clarifying there's a difference between the civil law powers of uh, a corporation and, a, and the common law powers of a corporation, how to define what those additional powers are if you're talking about adding natural person powers. And my interpretation of the natural person powers is the right to hold property, and uh, buy and sell without having to go and get additional legislation passed to allow them to do those things. They can do it whenever they want. Those are the two key powers that I saw. This, this point I'm making here is that I talked about symbols. You have to look for symbols in everything. And you can see on this page here you have the Canadian flag and the name of the department. And if you go to the actual, the, they have a symbol guidebook within the government saying this is how your letterhead should look. This is the color of the flag that it should be. It can't be another color. So they're standardized and how they're supposed to be. And when I first started researching in the late 90s, this Canada word mark used to be at the bottom of the page. It got moved up to the uh, top right here. So it's been migrating up. And there's actually some Canadian government websites that now have Canada in the top left. Law of the flag says this is the authority under which this is being issued. And as soon as you change this, you change the authority it's being issued under. This was the um, common law of Canada, possibly. And as soon as they slide this over and replace it, as far as I'm concerned, that's the corporate Canada that would then be issuing it. So this is the page describing uh, this, these uh, bi-jural uh, terminologies. So this is what it looked like in terms of uh, advertising the authority it was being issued under. Then, this was the new design, fancier, prettier, etc. But there's a fundamental difference here in that they brought this natural-looking maple leaf into it. Now, there's a lot of questions about did Canada go into bankruptcy and the U.S. go into bankruptcy and they're now out of bankruptcy or not. If bankruptcy occurred around 1929, 
nations are supposed to go into bankruptcy for 70 years. That puts you into 1999 is the year that Canada would have come out of bankruptcy. And there's been a number of changes that have occurred to our currency, to the legal system, uh, and a number of other ways that indicate that something changed. And uh, this, is for, as far as I was concerned, was one of the changes. The coat of arms was a major change in 1994. And uh, I'm going to touch on that in a few minutes. But uh, this here is, a, is the same authority it's being issued under. But they've added this natural um, thing here. This is a copyrighted, trademarked, artificial maple leaf. Maple leaves don't look like that. They look like this. So I thought it was interesting when this came in, and that was in around 2011. This one was taken. Well, I've been on government websites recently, and they've now changed again. And take a look at the latest in incarnation of this. You have a black and white bar across the top. A black bar across the top. It's a black bar across the bottom of the page. You've got reversed white type for the government and the flag. It's not like they got a shortage of ink on the web. All right, this should be a red and white flag. As far as I'm concerned, they're advertising that something has changed legally within uh, the government and that there's now some type of shadow government, private government, something that is operating in contradistinction to this particular government. And you'll notice this natural maple leaf has now been re replaced by the artificial nine-point maple leaf or 11-point, depending on how you count it. And you'll find this maple leaf down at the bottom of the page. So, like I said, with they're advertising all the time. Who's in power? Who's in control? What authority? Something has happened at the highest levels with regards to Canada as a nation, as far as I'm concerned, based on the changes to the coat of arms and uh, this type of advertising on the websites. And this is just as of uh, June 2013. Now, a lot of people go, private person, haven't heard it before, don't believe it exists. Great. All right. This is a search in Canley with regards to the term private person. Real easy to do. You just go to this address, canley.com, and it's quotation mark private person. There are 1,190 cases using the term private person. 70 legislation documents contain the term private person. And all of Canley has 1,200 there. So you can do a search on, on it and uh, open it up, and we won't do that now. Uh, and the term natural person, same thing. Put it in quotes, search it. You got 746 times the term natural person is used in legislation written into the law. And uh, that's uh, just an indication that both terms are still used within the law today. I'm not a person. So which person are you in a bi-jural world? Well, if you do the searches, I think that, and again, what I'm going to do is all this, this uh, presentation is going to be put online. All of these links are going to be part of the page that the presentation is on. So you don't have to write them down or figure them out. You'll be able to check them all tomorrow when the page is up. And uh, there's all place, all sorts of places where you can confirm that uh, there are two worlds, there are two persons, natural person and private person. You can be either one of them. If you're at common law, it doesn't really matter, but I personally stick to private person because it's specific. And you can choose whether you want that status or you want to uh, step into one of their civil law status. All right? Now, the big case which got me um, really convinced was the, the Russell Perisky case in 99 and 2000, 1999 2000. These are the years that I was in court for my own personal uh, matter, exact same charges that Perisky had. And um, I was, his, his trial occurred on the same day that my trial started. And I didn't find out about his trial until nine months or so after and uh, what went on. It's fully explored on the privateperson.com website uh, and it's a course called Do Common Law Courts Exist? My conclusions from that is that he won because the court recognized him in his status as a natural person and I walked through step by step by step how that was created, how that uh, occurred with the actual transcripts that we walked through line by line by line and I, and I give you my interpretation of what, the, what he said that uh, mattered, what the judge said that mattered, and, uh, and what went on. Now, many people will read the decision of a transcript and they will uh, look at what a judge says and, and they don't have the context. They didn't hear what happened before court. They didn't hear what happened at the pretrial hearings, etc. Every transcript from the Perisky case, from the very first time it was called in court with an uh, uncertified service of a, of a um, 
um, a summons, so there's no proof of service, so it got dismissed for every, from the very first time it was ever called till the decision to the court. The transcript is there, and I walked through everything. All right. Now, what happened that was of note was that there was a court order made by the judge at his initial attendance at court, where effectively Russ said, there's a mistake on the summons. The name on the summons is in Capitus Diminutio, Ma Diminutio Maxima, all letters capitalized in the name. The style is all uppercase, and that's incorrect. It should be upper and lowercase, first letter capitalized only. And the judge, after con considerable discussion and argument back and forth, Russ said at one point, I'm willing to accept any charge against, against me with the style of the name, first letter capitalized, but I will not consent to anything with this style of name. The judge ultimately acknowledged that he was there in his status as an actual person. Russ continued to press, and the judge made an order that he was a natural person, and he made an order that he was the defendant in that particular case. Now, an order from the judge is not giving him a status. An order from the judge is, I heard your, your argument and your discussion. I listened to what you had to say. I've decided I agree with you, or I've decided I disagree with you. Now move on. No more discussion about it. That's all it is. He's made a decision. This is a decision. Move on. So the judge said, fine, you've proved to me your status as a natural person. I recognize that. Now move on to the next issue. And uh, he also made, joined him to the charges in that status. Now, there's a story which is told in that full, full uh, exploration of that course of what happened in the subsequent hearings leading up to the trial where the Crown tried to trick him into uh, accepting the full uppercase name again. And there was a partner of the local law firm who was the prosecutor at the first hearing who was replaced by an articling student at the next hearing. There's a clue there. When you got a lawyer who slips out because something has happened he can't participate in, like I said, that's a clue. Anyways, day of trial comes, they show up at court, and they say, oh, gee, uh, all the courtrooms are full here in Abbotsford, but we have a spare courtroom down in Chilliwack. Would you mind going 20 miles down the road to Chilliwack? We have a courtroom all ready for you there. And they've got 20 or 30 you know, people who have come along to observe and stuff like that, and they end up heading off down to Chilliwack or excuse me, down to Abbotsford. Again, the whole story, all the details are, are with the course. Now, when they show up at this courthouse, they see a Canadian flag flying on the roof line of that particular courtroom. Not the courthouse, that particular courtroom. That one courtroom has a roof line that extends above the courthouse roof line. And there was a Canadian flag attached to the uh, corner of that roof line. And then when they walk into the court, there's no benches, no witness box, uh, no court clerk's bench, etc. It's flat tables and chairs, and uh, they proceed to have their uh, what I consider to be a mock trial. My interpretation is that they had to move jurisdictions from Chilliwack, which is a federally incorporated city, to a provincially incorporated city prior to a certain year uh, where they have Abbotsford police. It's a different jurisdiction. Common law jurisdiction court exists in that jurisdiction. They had to clear out all the court paraphernalia and actually have flat tables and chairs. You've heard of having a level playing field. That's what common law is, a level playing field. They had the trial up to the point of the Crown closing their case. And then without him opening his mouth, the Crown uh, or the judge argued with the Crown that they hadn't proven their case. The Crown successfully argued that particular point. The judge went away, came back, and argued a different point. And the Crown, as far as I'm concerned, successfully argued that point as well. I agreed with the Crown's position. But the judge disagreed, acquitted Russ without him saying anything in his own defense or raising any issues whatsoever, and um, then the Crown did not appeal the acquittal. That's the quick overview of it. As far as I'm concerned, it's a very clear case. I dissect everything in the course, and there's lots more information there for you if you want the details of it. And uh, I've studied that in light of all of my personal experiences in court, watching judges react to natural person, how they've changed their tactics over the years, how CRA, our IRS up here, uh, has reacted to uh, the term private person over the years. Them modifying in order to try and stay in a lawful way. So my conclusions with regards to that is that there was a one issue, one fact, one outcome. 
He made his status claim of natural person. The judge made an order recognizing that, and an order binds all the other judges that come after him to recognize that that is the state of things, and they can't change that. An order can be only be overturned by going to a higher court and having that appealed. So once that order was made the first time, each judge thereafter was bound to recognize it and deal with that case as a natural person. And I believe that there's a technical disconnect between a natural person being charged with a statute case and the uh, common law man who is before the court. It just can't happen. But they had to allow the case to play out as if it really didn't make any difference. He hadn't won anything. And then they have this fake trial and they get a decision out of it and then people forget about it and it's lost in time and it becomes, you know, one of those urban legends that this actually happened. And I didn't want that to happen. So I researched it, collected all the evidence I could. Uh, there's a video of Russ giving a walk around tour of the court uh, and, uh, and showing, you know, talking about it and stuff like that. So I wanted it to be recorded so people could continue to research it in the future because ultimately fiction must yield to truth and the truth is that the natural person can't be charged with these statute offenses and when the natural person is recognized or the private person is recognized that that is the status they have and that it's been the, the, the private person that has been charged the system now has to self-correct and find a way to get that person out of the court either by staying the charges, withdrawing the charges, finding a technical out somewhere along the line, or having a mock trial all the way to the point of getting the judge to acquit him. I find it personally unbelievable that they went to that particular point, because as far as I'm concerned, it exposed the game. But uh, they did, and we have that record, and I'm promoting the existence of that record, <laughs> so people are, um, are aware of it. Now, some people ask, well, what happened to Russ because he was subsequently charged about four years ago, I guess, five years ago, somewhere around there, with tax evasion. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, Russ, from my understanding, because I didn't get uh, the full personal story with this, but my understanding is that he accepted the status of taxpayer and wanted to go into their system and win with taxpayer arguments, which for me is just crazy. But uh, that's uh, the general position he took. He did try some status stuff partway through, which appeared to have some effects. But uh, ultimately, it wasn't properly set up. They were in the wrong court, in the wrong status, and uh, he was convicted uh, uh, at, that particular, at that particular instance. So he dealt with it entirely differently than he did the first time. And he never wanted to understand. I was talking to him, uh, him about this for years, walk, going through it, walking him through it. He didn't want to know about this. He didn't want to know anything about court process. When he started his uh, tax evasion trial, he hired lawyers. And he left it entirely in their hands after trying to educate them about his interpretations. Not the way to go, I don't believe. So um, uh, this is uh, Russ's information. From the, uh, from the first trial in 1999-2000. And you can see the uh, highlighted red areas. You've got the coat of arms of British Columbia, which is not the official coat of arms of British Columbia. It is a, um, a look-alike, but if you compare it to the official coat of arms, it is a, only a look-alike, made to appear similar, and as far as I'm concerned, deceptively so. Uh, and it's a full caps British Columbia. They make it look up or in lower case, but it is actually full caps. Canada is in full uppercase. Province of British Columbia is in full uppercase. Those are different jurisdictional indications using capitus. And there's a distinction with capitus. Many times I've been in court and judges say, well, capitalization doesn't mean anything. Well, they're half right. It doesn't mean anything when they have a private person there. Because capitus diminutium is a, as a legal principle concept only exists in Roman civil law. So when you're dealing with a private person, capitalization is irrelevant. It is. But when they're playing in the Roman civil law world, and they're trying to get you into the Roman civil law world, capitalization means everything. Because that's when they look at this paperwork, as you see here, yes, the principles are the same in every commonwealth country. This is the same game everywhere. When you see the capitalization here, they are advertising to you. I am taking you into the artificial Canada. I am taking you into the province of British Columbia, the artificial one. Do you have anything to say about this? 
They are advertising the authority in their jurisdiction, and it's up to you to raise it. That's my interpretation of it. And you'll see here with account one uh, and count two and other counts, his uh, name was changed by handwriting by the judge to upper and lower case from the full upper case. Went from maxima to minima. And they are still playing this game, except when I walked into court and challenged the name, Russ walked into court and challenged the name, other people walked in and challenged the style of the name, they started correcting their paperwork. Summons started coming in minima within a year or so. Uh, the information started to be in media, which is the last name, fully capitalized only. So they have modified the procedures as we've pointed them out, but they have still defaulted to the maxima name or the media name uh, with all of their informations. And they will fight you and argue with you, threaten you, intimidate you if you raise it as an issue because they don't want to change it because they lose the ability to play their game, in my opinion, if they change it to the minima name. And I have another case I'll be addressing shortly with regards to that. Those two issues, the jurisdictional issue with regards to cap, full cap Canada and province of British Columbia, and the style of the name uh, are everything advertising who they're bringing to court, who they want in court, and uh, jurisdiction. Now this is a transcript. Um, by the way, Russ never ordered his transcripts. One of the guys, uh, one of my fellow researchers asked me, has Russ ever ordered his transcripts? I said, no. And uh, so he went and he ordered them. He ordered every single transcript from the first time it was called in court. And all the transcripts came in one batch at one time. And uh, so one order and every transcript came with it. This is why you see multiple dates here. And this is the style of the name that they have on the um, information. Excuse me, this is the, um, you see that in the Provincial Court of British Columbia is in full uppercase. You'll also notice that there's a square box around it. Law of boxing says anything in the box doesn't exist on the page. So that's something to consider might be in play here. The name uh, Regina, I believe, is the fiction name for uh, the crown. Because when you're dealing at common law, it's Her Majesty in right of uh, uh, British Columbia or in right of Canada. Uh, and then, of course, his name in full uppercase. Now, this is a transcript. This is less descriptive than the information, which is the charging document for the uh, court. It's the charging document, the information that the court is proceeding on, which is the most important document for the style to be represented correctly on. So if it's incorrect on here, it's less of an issue. But this was the transcript of his actual trial. This is the transcript of the hearings. Look at the style of the province of British Columbia. But when it came to them trans transcribing the actual trial, they changed the style of the name prov prov province, Provincial Court of British Columbia, and they added the word Canada to it. Now, this is very interesting to me. And it went from a box to a rounded corner box. Again, I don't know if that means anything, but just noticing differences. Now, if you order, if you order transcripts and you're getting transcript one through nine all at the same time, you would think that all of the cover pages would be the same, especially since they're all being transcribed by the exact same transcription company. But the trial transcript reflects a different style of type, different type style for the name of the court and for Canada. And the word Canada did not exist on the first transcripts. All right. So why have they added Canada and why have they changed it to this Old English? Well, I just happen to have a book on language and Old English and as far as I understand, this is the representation of common law when they use old English lettering. So watch for old English lettering. They're advertising to you a common law matter. And you'll see this in various places. The other consideration is when you put them side by side, right, you go, hey, there's a big difference. One is an upper and lower case and one is full caps. Gee, you think there's a difference? Plus you got the old English in there. Plus you've got the word Canada, it's not a word. It is actually letters spaced out. C space, A space, N space. That's not a word. That's a collection of letters that you are fully entitled to look at and go, there's a word. But in fact, it's just a collection of letters. So, you know, interesting distinction to make and to look for. Are they advertising? What are they advertising? I'm not quite sure, but I have my, uh, my opinions about it. Okay? So as you can see that there are subtle advertisements, and that's what I refer to them as, 
where they are, who they are, what they're doing, who they're dealing with. And uh, it's your job to be very careful watching them. And when I talk to people about their paperwork and I go over their paperwork, I say, did you notice? Notice the capitalization of the province of British Columbia. Oh, no, I didn't. I, why don't I? We're not used to looking for it. So it's just a matter of uh, reminding yourself to look at it. Now, there is an Ontario case that went on in 2013. Um, there's a question here. What if the judge gets all mean and says, uh, if you argue type thing? Well, yes. If they get all mean, that means you've hit the nail on the head and they want you to get off of it. And this is part of what I'm going to address right now, is they are not just threatening people, not just getting intimidated, intimidating, they are actually um, putting people in jail in British Columbia and uh, in Ontario who raise this particular issue. And it's the way that they're doing it, which again, exposes the game and what they're doing. So there's an Ontario case where a gentleman showed up, challenged the name that was on it, and he was arrested for failing to appear while while he was in court attending. Now there's a difference between appearing in court and attending. The summons actually says in Her Majesty's name you are commanded to attend court. And then when you get to court they want you to appear for the name on the information. And that's a transition from the real to the fiction. That's a transition from the private person attending court to becoming liable for the artificial person that's on the information. Um, so the, he, he attended court, he's standing in court, he's addressing the matter when it was called, so he's fulfilling the requirements of attending. They had him physically removed from the courtroom. And then the Crown comes back in, calls the matter again, and then uh, has an arrest warrant issued for him failing to attend court. That particular case, he was facing tax evasion and multiple years in jail. They, uh, and he's only one of many across Canada who have had an arrest warrant issued for them in spite of the fact they attended court in compliance with the summons and uh, the courts failed to recognize them because they did not agree to appear for the artificial name on the information. They raised the issue of the name, the style of the name of the person, the status of the person, and the courts roll along and they either issue the warrant, even with the person standing there, send them off to jail, or ask the Crown if they want a warrant and the judge and the Crown says yes we do and the judge issues it. Um, so he's one of many in multiple jurisdictions. Multiple prosecutors in different jurisdictions, multiple judges. And uh, he complained by having a uh, constitutional complaint that his rights were violated with it and everything changed. They were not willing to negotiate with him at all and uh, then as soon as they filed the constitutional complaint with regards to the uh, occurrences, uh, with regards to the arrest and the improper behavior of the prosecutor, all of a sudden, let's negotiate. And they negotiated down four years in prison, down to six months of house arrest, uh, minimal, minimal fines, etc., in order not to have the matter or the um, uh, constitutional complaint actually heard. It was filed, but it was not proceeded with. Now, an interesting thing about the way the system works is they had a lawyer uh, uh, dealing with the matter, negotiating with the prosecution. So they uh, agree to this plea deal. And uh, when they come to the day of trial, they inform the judge, we have come to a, uh, a, a plea arrangement and they've agreed to play guilt, plea guilty and we need to stand down in order to discuss it. And the two lawyers and the judge go off into the back room, forget this, 45 minutes. And they come back out. What do you think they discussed for 45 minutes? What I believe they discussed is the prosecutor said to the judge, look, this guy's supposed to get four years, everybody else is getting four years, but they filed this complaint, and it highlights a lot of improprieties within our system. And if we don't give them uh, this minimal slap on the wrist, house arrest situation, then, then they're going to proceed with their complaint and expose all this stuff that's going on that shouldn't be going on. And I would assume that the judge agreed to it because they come back out and the judge says, gee, everybody else is getting a lot more penalty. Why are you asking for so little in this case? And then the lawyer does a song and dance as to, well, they've done this, they've done that, they've done the other thing. Therefore, we think it's appropriate that this minimal sentence is, is, is fair. And uh, that's what they did. 
is they uh, agreed to, the, the judge agreed to the minimal sentence in order to make their constitutional complaint uh, disappear from the court system. And uh, we're dealing with a number of people who are going to be raising this issue over the near future, hopefully, because they've all been arrested in a similar manner. Prosecutors and judges definitely work together. It's clearer in some cases than others, and some judges uh, are not involved. I have been in front of judges who are honorable people. They're doing with it, dealing with it as a law issue and just doing procedures they're taught, but many of them are actively participating in it. So they negotiated a plea for a greatly reduced penalty. So I think they could have uh, eliminated the charges entirely, but they decided not to take that risk and uh, took the plea bargain, which is fine. Everybody's got to decide what's best for them. So there's a Kelowna case where the accused went into court the very first time, challenged the style of the name. The judge is preoccupied, says, I got family I want to get home to, so sure, I don't care, <laughs> effectively. Changes the style on the information from, uh, ma from media, last name all caps, to minima. They go away, they come back again uh, a few months later, and the Crown enters an amended information. And they have changed the name on it to media again. Without any awareness from anybody, the Crown just enters a C2 with the or, uh, second information with this media name on it, back to media. And then a few months later, the Crown changes it back to minima on their own again. I believe it's because they got called on it behind the scenes that you can't change that because the judge changed it, made an order to that effect, and therefore you changing it back to media is improper, so you got to fix it and put it back to minima, which is what they did. So the Crown varied it and corrected it back in, and the judge has subsequently communicated to this individual via, via letter with directions and instructions which I've never had or seen communications uh, from a judge to a lay litigant before getting assistance and has actually he's actually warned the crown uh, with regards to some situations again um, doing what he's supposed to do when he has a private person in there their job is to protect the private person and that is part of your status of private person in the system that's what it gives you is the courts are there to protect you and ensure your rights aren't being violated and when you get that status recognized Behind the scenes, they act to protect you. You don't have to do anything after that. And that's what uh, I saw in Russ's initial trial. That's what I've seen in this case, and that's what I've seen in a few other. There's a recent Vancouver case where the name style began with the minima style on the information. It's the very first information I've ever seen where the name on the information of the accused was actually in minima to begin with. All names, upper and lower case. So the issue became at the uh, arraignment hearing, which they were really pushing for, was, well, I, the name can't be argued because the style's correct. So let's talk about Canada and province of British Columbia. And province, Canada and province of British Columbia on the information is in full uppercase. The summons is in minima, uh, first letter capitalized. And if you actually go to the criminal code and look at the form that the information is in the criminal code, it's a prescribed form, which means it is the form they have to use uh, without modifying. The form in the criminal code indicates minima, first letter capitalized for Canada and province of British Columbia. So the issue is raised with the judge that Canada and province of British Columbia on the information are incorrect. It's a different, it indicates a different jurisdiction. And that different jurisdiction, what the Crown is trying to do is revenue the individual from common law into some other jurisdiction. I don't know what other jurisdiction is. I don't care what other jurisdiction is. It's just I ain't going there because I'm staying in common law. So the arraignment challenged at that particular time being revenued out of common law. The judge then made an offer after uh, this all occurred to personally negotiate with the individual a settlement between between uh, it's a tax evasion charge uh, between the tax uh, uh, between the prosecutor and uh, and the individual I've never seen nor heard of a judge making an offer to personally negotiate with an individual um, at any point in time never mind uh, at that stage of proceedings and the revenue issue is being applied in other cases that are presently before the courts, so there's going to be more progress on that in the future and understanding of that. But my belief is that they advertised they were taking the individual from common law into another jurisdiction. They pointed it out. They said, that's what I believe that means. I do not consent to that, 
and and I believe that uh, it's improper to do so. And the individual said, I cannot consent to, um, what was the phrase? Um, cannot consent to being revenued. Um, I don't remember the, the exact phrase that was used, but uh, the whole idea changed the dynamics at the end with the judge making an offer to the individual to, uh, to settle the matter. And again, unheard of with regards to a federal crown prosecution in provincial court on a tax evasion charge. Uh, interesting. So it's all a game. Learn the rules of the game and your role in the game. And that, for me, is private person at common law, and I'm sticking to it. Be honorable in your actions. Don't be threatening. Don't be, uh, you know, abusive or anything else. It's not necessary. You stay in honor. Uh, they go into dishonor. They lose. There's uh, uh, an entire course on um, uh, privateperson.com about communicating uh, honorably. Complaining about rule breakers. One of your obligations at common law is to report lawbreakers. That's part of your job. It's not just to keep the peace yourself. It's to participate in the keeping the peace by reporting and being a witness against somebody who steals something, harms an individual or property, etc. That's part of our responsibility to keep the peace, is to report peace breakers, whether it's a, it's a physical or it's other type of abuse that goes on. And when anybody's not obeying the law, that's not keeping the peace. It's our job to report it. And we haven't been fulfilling our obligation to report uh, these uh, improper actions and hold uh, the lawyers and the judges and civil servants and police officers and whoever else to account. So you need to understand your action before you act. Before you act. I got into trouble, painted a, uh, a bullseye on my back way back in the early days by sending a letter that somebody else had written uh, uh, refusing to pay GST because that was their understanding at the time and that just, you know, down the rabbit hole I went. Um, I didn't fully understand it. I used somebody else's understanding and I paid the price for it uh, in many ways. Um, seek confirmation of the rules. Confirmation by watching what people do, seeing the reactions, interpreting the reactions. Um, I sit in court. I, I have literally hundreds of hours of sitting in courts watching judges and, um, and then a couple hundred hours of my own time in the well of the court. I watch how a judge reacts to a question. I watch how the, a witness reacts to a question. I, I watch how the court reacts. Um, last time I was in court and used private person, both the judge and the, uh, or the, f the first time in my most, most recent visits, both the judge and the um, court clerk threw their arms up in the air and made a bunch of noise as soon as I raised the issue of private person. And whenever you got them doing that, uh, you know uh, the game is up and they're getting nervous. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's confirmation. That's not scaring me off the point. That's telling me I'm on the point. So one of the interpretations with the game is everybody is uh, some type of vessel on the sea of commerce, etc. Well, there's a lot of different ways to interpret that. One way potentially to interpret it is if I'm a spiritual being having a human experience, I'm playing the game of you know having a human experience, one way they might interpret it is that the spirit is the man, quote unquote. The body is, you know, part of the earth. And when you combine the two, you've incorporated the two. It's now a corporation. It's now a vessel. And they're trying to claim jurisdiction over that vessel, possibly. There's lots. There's some philosophical. There's some uh, a whole bunch of different ways of looking at it. And um, there's some ideas out there with regards to uh, registering your vessel through the motor vehicle branch. Um, and uh, and all that. How do they do it? I don't know all how they do it. I don't know how they play all of the game. Uh, I'm interested in uh, staying in common law and I don't have to understand all the other games they play. So my goal is to get that recognized. Commonwealth countries are common law. All the stuff I'm talking about uh, should be 100% applicable in any common law venue. Your pro the proper notice to you and your consent is required. Most of their game is structured around the fact that they have given you notice. You just don't see that notice. You don't understand that notice. And they give the impression or they make the assumption, presumption, you have given your consent. As soon as you notify them, you haven't gotten proper notice. And as soon as you notify them, you don't give them consent. They have lost all legal authority to proceed and move you to another venue. And that's the trick, is not get scared off of those two things. 
Each country, interesting, each country that's a common, common law country has one state that is a Roman civil law state. There's uh, Quebec in, in Canada, there's Louisiana in um, the United States, and uh, there's one Roman civil law state in the uh, United Kingdom, I recently found out. I don't remember which one it is. But think about it. If you want to take over a common law country, wedge in civil law, and then allow Roman civil law to gradually take over all of the processes and all the procedures and all the people's attitudes and ideas of how things should work. I have asked lawyers from day one, do you know what a natural person is? Not one of them has given me a proper and correct answer that you anybody could read out of a dictionary. And uh, they're not trained in it. I've had one guy say, well, it sounds familiar. I heard it in, I think, first year law, but they never talked about it after that. These people are not trained in natural person and, and private person until a certain point in their education. And if they know about it, they're gone from the court as soon as you raise it because now they're liable because they're participating in the fraud with knowledge. So they seek your consent to impose um, non-common law, anything else. Like Again, I don't care what, what else they want to take me to. You begin at common law. You walk in the door at common law and you move yourself to Roman civil law by allowing them to move you there. One fellow went in, made his claim of status. The judge... Uh, it, issued the arrest warrant for the name party a sheriff came up and grabbed him and took him out the back door and the question is how did the sheriff know he was the name party and why is he being arrested if he's standing there but they bring him back into the court a couple hours later the first thing the judge says to him is have you learned your lesson yet that's a clue what lesson is that I'm supposed to learn judge just roll over and accept the name on the information not use the term natural person you don't want me to use it I mean what is it and uh, this is the game they're now playing. We will arrest you to try and get you off that particular point. And I believe there's ways to avoid that, uh, that particular process. Um, as a matter of fact, I know there is. And it's usually when people uh, are trying it out, don't quite know how to address it properly, or they get a real jerk of a judge, um, which is entirely possible. But again, there's ways to hold them to account, I believe. But it is a little bit of a crapshoot, absolutely. So where are you then? Admiralty, Royal, uh, Roman Civil Law, Trust, Marshall, who cares? It's all irrelevant. Equity may factor into it. I don't care what game they've created. I don't care what fiction world they've created. I don't care what they call it. I don't care what their rules are. I don't care how many times they change those rules. If I'm not stepping into that building, it, none of it applies to me. The only thing that matters to me is that I believe I have rights of common law and protections of common law, and that's where I'm staying. All right? It hurts my brain to even think about all that other stuff. I've studied the trust stuff. I've studied the admiralty stuff, yada, yada, yada. And it's like, it's interesting to a point to know how they play it. It's important to know how they get you into it, yes. But do I need to figure it out and beat them at that particular game? It's their game, their rules. They change the rules. They interpret the rules however they want. Why would I ever want to go there? So uh, my strategy is just sticking at common law and getting recognized there. It's fiction that they control and it's not fair. And uh, so if they control it, their bat, their ball, their game, uh, I don't want to play. It's safe, safer and easier not to leave common law. And when you claim the status of private person, you have declared that you're in and at common law and nothing else. There's a little bit more you could do. I would proactively uh, declare that you don't consent to anything other than common law. And you don't consent to being taken to any other uh, you know, venue, right? So you exist in common law as a private person and potentially as a natural person as well. That should be recognized as well, and it has been. All right? You have protections at that level of law. So as far as I'm concerned, retain them. Now people go, well, yeah, but well, you know, I got duties if I'm a private person. You know, they they, they make, can make me do things. Well, if you read the Capitus Diminutio definition, it's a minimum loss of status. You do give up some freedom. You want to become within the law to say I'm willing to play by certain rules just basic rules and uh, you know be respectful etc so you move from being outside the law to being in law by giving up that status and the duties that now attach to you is do no harm or threat of harm to people or property and I like that one and I want that one to be enforced for me because when somebody comes into when those outlaws come into town and uh, you know hurt me or take my stuff the sheriff goes out and tries to catch them and get my stuff back and then also take them to court and prosecute them so they don't come do it again. That's the protection of common law. The law will go out and try and eliminate the outlaws from coming and hurting you. 
Um, and uh, that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. Golden rule. If you live by the golden rule and you don't do any head or th harm or threat of harm, hey, it's all good. Keep the peace and report peacebreakers. We have not been reporting the peacebreakers. The lawyers and judges, which is a self-regulated uh, forum, they don't have any outside regulations, uh, needs to be reined back in. And uh, they need to be reported. If you disagree with what a judge has done, how he has behaved in the courtroom, he's yelled at you, he's intimidated you, he's threatened you, make a complaint to the Judicial Council that uh, you can make a complaint to. Uh, you can't complain about their decision to the Judicial Council, but you can complain about their behavior. Have it evidenced by transcript, have it evidenced by witness, and uh, they get a black mark on their record, they get enough of those, they got a problem. Same thing with a lawyer. If we're not complaining on the record, then we have given them permission to do it to us again and again and to do it to everybody else. We can't be afraid of these people. We need to use the complaint processes properly. And again, I have a course on your complaint is their restraint um, on, the, on, the, um, on the website. So your minimum loss of status um, is your rights. Your privacy, property, and contract protections. The courts are there to, to mitigate these things to be a neutral referee in these things for you and you get the protection of the arm of the law. You get access to the courts and the law will enforce your judgments uh, to a certain degree anyways um, with regards to uh, the complaints that you bring at this level of law. Now um, you need the standing to seek the remedy which is uh, again to my mind private person is the standing at common law to access that. Now how they're winning right now is you don't know who you are in law. You don't know which status. People are saying, I don't want to play at all. I want to be a human being. I want a man. You can't have me at all. Well, they don't recognize that. They've got a, they got a level of law that they're going to drag you into, and it's going to be their game unless you uh, choose common law, in my opinion. You don't know the game. You don't know how court works. I mean, what's the chance of you winning? You don't know the rules. What's the chance of you winning? It's, just, it's all stacked against you. You don't know how to communicate in an honorable fashion, asking questions, and basically binding them by the questions you ask and uh, um, and the things the minimal things that you do claim you don't need to claim very much and you shouldn't claim very much you don't know how where or when to complain and we need to know we need to learn how when and where to complain which means making a legal complaint uh, as well as making a uh, ethical complaint to any associations these people are a part of and uh, this system behind the scenes will at some point kick in and start holding these people to account. Uh, again, I've seen that work and I'm seeing it work more now. You believe you have no power because we've all been taught to be disempowered. So again, none of us stand a chance in this is the state this was the state of things when I started court for me. And it's been a long road <laughs> and I don't have the answers to all of it and I don't know all of this stuff, but I, I know enough of it to uh, stay out of as much as possible. <laughs> So how you in is know who you are in law and which law. I'm a private person in common law. That's it. And uh, um, know that, that you know the control games in common law and Ro Roman civil law. Uh, how to control them with common law. How they might try and control you with Roman civil law. You need to know what the tricks and traps are. And again, there's not a lot. It's just principle-based stuff. Know the basic rules. Know how to communicate honorably. How, where, when to complain. And uh, know you have the power in common law, so stay there. Again, that's my conclusion, that's my interpretation, and that's what I'm doing. Uh, I encourage you to investigate that more fully. Some people think we live in a pr pr prison planet. Eh, yeah, quite possibly, because they're doing all these things. They're dumbing us down, they're keeping us in fear and afraid of authority. They're making us sick with food, chemicals, drugs. They're keeping us sick by practicing medicine. Not all medicine's bad, but uh, you know a lot of it out there is keep a high stress rate in, in our daily lives, it all you know adds to it, convincing everybody we're powerless and that all power and answers are outside of ourselves. This is the major control system that's in place right now and we need to reverse it. There's a lot of this going on literally across the world from all levels. We're now seeing the fiction games for what they are. We got to end the fear, the stinking thinking and the question authority and question authority as a result of that. Eat clean food, no chemicals, no drugs, use caution with modern medicine, reduce stress, and know that you're powerful and use your power for good. Be a witness. The most powerful thing we can do is be a witness for people when they go to court and then by filing complaints as witnesses when these people are not acting properly. 
A judge's duty on the bench is to maintain the decorum in the courtroom, not enter the fray, not raise the emotion of the courtroom. And if they are yelling, screaming, uh, uh, interfering in any way, threatening you, they have broken their ethical behavior boundaries. And your complaint evidenced uh, will cause them a serious problem. Your objection in the moment and describing exactly what they did so that there's a written record of what you saw, experienced, and felt will stop them from doing you stop them from doing it at the time and give you the evidence to make a complaint with. Very, very powerful to be a witness and make a record of it. We want proof. Everybody wants proof. I want to see a case law that says this stuff. Well, guess what? You're not going to get it. They're not going to put it in black and white on the record. You're going to have to uh, interpret actions. You're going to have to interpret the way that things are stated. You're going to have to interpret the fact that they don't follow through with cases, etc. Can you lose and still win? Well, yeah, there's people who have uh, admitted to very minor things in order to end the bigger issues, and it allows them to get off the hook, and you get on with your life, and you know, if you've done a good job of causing them problems, they may not bother you again. They leave you alone and set up the mass last minute. Uh, if you if you cause them enough problems, they will leave you alone. And the way they will prove that you're right is they will settle with you on the courthouse steps and uh, and not allow it to get to court. Or like in Prisky's case, they'll have an entire fake trial. I mean, it was done the first day, yet they had to play it out, try and bring him back in, never succeeded, and then they had to have that fake trial for um, for it to proceed from there. They're all puzzle pieces that paint a picture. So <clears throat> proper notice is key, consent is key, threats and intimidation is the tools that they use. They, they have given you notice, you just haven't seen it in the way that you think you should. They imply consent and they use threats and intimidation. It's the appearance of consent that's all they need in order to proceed. Don't give it to them, make it clear there is no appearance of consent. You're the power, the real, they are the fiction. Do you know your power really? And that's the point of this presentation is to try and show you the power you have as a private person in common law. I believe there is a rule of law and they are guided by it. Uh, they, they seem to break it all the time, I agree. It's getting worse right now, but the more public it becomes that they are breaking it, the more obvious it becomes, the more people complain about it. That is the only thing that's going to hold them accountable to it. They will obey it when pushed to, and we need to push them to obey it. Not through violence, but through proper complaint processes and legal challenges and uh, lawsuits against the individual um, instigators of it. The appearance of justice most of the time is what they offer, not real justice. Justice exists when the power, the real, speaks to them with authority. Only the private person can speak to the court with real authority that they have to listen to. And uh, that's, I think, the best chance for justice. And justice will come when they fear exposure. They're getting more and more exposure that what they're doing and how they're doing it is wrong. That's what I'm doing, many other people are doing all across the world. The exposure is happening and we need to step it up. And justice will continue if we are vigilant after the fact. We can't just go back to sleep after we get them learning to do things properly again. Uh, there has to be ongoing vigilance with regards to it. So the principles of all of this is that there are two parallel systems. Both work. The common law system still exists. It still functions. But they don't want you to use it. And it's waiting for anybody who triggers it. Everything they do is presumption only. You question the presumptions. They maintain power via intimidation. They will self-correct when pushed to do so. You have always had the power to stand up. You must object and evidence the complaint. These are the things that uh, can you need to understand at a principle level. If you understand these principles, if you come to the point of believing these principles, and I'm not saying you have to, but your research needs to uh, be done in order to convince yourself, um, there's a chance. So there is a Hope for Justice course on privateperson.com. And it is private-person.com is the uh, web address. There is a Hope for Justice courts, uh, course called Do Common Law Courts Exist? And that is where I go over the capitus as well as the perisky and other related matters where I de believe I demonstrate that uh, common law courts do exist and operate. The Hope for Justice in Action course is about the communicating in honor. It's uh, honor and dishonor and uh, conditional acceptance which are recognized processes which we have a number of successful results on that particular uh, um, course with regards to that and it is what appears to be how the system functions and operates very important valuable stuff and it's not just about law it's general life uh, principles it's very good stuff your complaint is their restraint this was the principle that 
you have to complain to restrain them. Your failure to complain in the moment and after the fact gives them permission to continue. And it is really just the bully syndrome. They are bullies. They need to be stood up to. How to file complaints, charges, and lawsuits. So if you want to continue education, those three courses are there. The first one is uh, wide open to members. The second two is by donation and uh, helps me um, uh, you know, pay the bills. Many articles and free webinars on the website. I encourage you to check them out. I do have some courses uh, that are sitting on the hard drive and in planning stages. How and why to get a private bank account. Private banking does exist in Canada. Uh, there is no requirement whatsoever to provide identification. The only thing you need is a signature. It is in the law. It is there. They just don't want you to access it. Uh, the process is all laid out and it's a matter again of holding them accountable to what the law actually says instead of allowing them to get away with what they're getting away with. And um, I'm hoping to gather a group of proactive people who want to go to banks and uh, create the challenges necessary in lawful, polite ways to uh, uh, force them to obey the law. Right? Laying complaints against they. There's a part two. The, the complaint is there. Restraint is there. There's a part two coming as those complaints go through uh, actual court process. Doing private business. Uh, I operate privately, always have, and uh, that's our right. And this is where the tax evasion course, uh, court process has come in right now. Is uh, They claim that you have no right to operate privately whatsoever. Any money you receive uh, with regards to any type of pri pri private business is, is their money. Uh, that's a big issue for me, which uh, we'll be pursuing. As any suggestions or recommendations, uh, you're welcome to make them. Uh, I'm open to uh, discussing stuff. If anybody's got a... Um, a course uh, that they've put together. I do invite other present, present courses and I'll host it and uh, host the webinar as well as uh, host it on the website program. Um, and um, and uh, that's, a, that's an invitation out to, to all of you. So uh, I've gone a little bit longer than I expected with regards to the presentation and I'm going to be looking at the uh, questions and I'm going to ask um, uh, Glenn to come back in here and any comments or uh, questions or uh, points. By the way, I'm committed to finding the right answer, not necessarily being right. I would, if anything is incorrect and you can prove it's incorrect, then I'm happy to correct it because I want to find out what's right and make that available as the uh, correct um, uh, presentation. And there are many interpretations and there's nuances and stuff. But the principal base, I'm happy to uh, to uh, you know discuss and, and to correct anything that uh, needs correction. Absolutely. So, Glenn, if you want to unmute yourself, and if you've got any comments or questions, and enter the conversation, I'm just going to take a quick look at the questions and see if there's anything that uh, hasn't been answered. Um, well, uh, I, it's all quite interesting. I, I know that um, there's a lot of validity. Uh, to what you've talked about, uh, I'm using that material uh, in in my stuff that I'm dealing with right now, and um, um, uh, it's interesting because um, I I haven't had any issues with um, um, uh, like uh, you always hear these horror stories about the judges yelling at you or or just walking all over you, and and that definitely did not happen with me, and and I think it's because I filed paperwork into the case. And, um, you know, he even said, with all due respect, you're wrong, you know, but he said, with all due respect, you know, um, you know, I mean, uh, um, uh, I, I think that um, uh, there's a lot of validity to this and, and um, 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 by, by filing paperwork into the case, you have to be proactive, you've got to be on the attack. And, um, and that judge in that first hearing, he said, um, I told him I've been challenging this for three years. That's why I filed that lawsuit. And um, and he said, well, he said, uh, I, I told him I, they don't have jurisdiction. I've been challenging jurisdiction. And and he said, well, he says, uh, if there's no jurisdiction, there's nothing to rule on. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a that's exactly the point. <laughs> yeah. Now you you you've by filing paperwork, you've also in your paperwork made status claims, which is putting notice to the court. And a lot of your paperwork right. is aggressive in nature which means that you're putting them on notice you're not going to put up with their crap and you're willing to yeah. stand your ground and that's what they're looking for is they're looking for people they can push around and you've advertised to them that you're not willing to be pushed around so they are cautious because they know you'll speak out all right 
they don't want to be called right. on their bad behavior. And most people, yeah, no most people, I mean, my, the joke I, I put on myself in uh, the beginning when I finished my first uh, trial process was I wasn't objectionable enough. I did not object to all the instances where the, the judge acted improperly because I've been trained to be nice and not to you know, speak back to authority and all that other sort of stuff, right? And right. we have to point out on the record and describe what they did and how we found it objectionable. That's our right, that's our obligation, and that's what will rein them in. And you do that with your paperwork up front, absolutely, yeah. Well, and I think that's a great idea of, of saying uh, uh, on and for the record, let the record show that the judge just yelled at me, you know what I mean? And that the judge is intimidating me, and that the judge has prejudged this case and already decided it, so let's, uh, why don't we just get the lynch mob out? You know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, uh, the, the, first, the, first part, the first part is the part that would be reviewed as to the judge's behavior. As soon as you get into the opinion and judgment about that behavior, that's kind of a secondary issue, which to my mind, if you do file a complaint, um, that's where the honorable, that's where the, the honorable stance, and, we've, and with regards to your paperwork, the more honorable you are, the worse they look. And uh, so I would pull it back a bit and just point out what they did wrong and that they've gone into dishonor doing it. They're not supposed to enter the fray by bringing that emotion to it. So uh, stick to the facts and uh, point out their obligation to obey the uh, ethics or principles or, or the legislation that guides them. That's all you need in a complaint. And as soon as you get to anything else, uh, they get a chance to find gray areas or uh, write it off. So. Uh, I've tried to simpl yeah, I've tried to simplify my paperwork. I try to get everything down to one or two pages. <laughs> yeah, and I understand what you're doing, and um, you know, quite frankly, my attitude is is I don't want to be there. Uh, they attack me, and I'm going to make it their worst nightmare. Right. And uh, right now, and, you're and, they're you know that may not be they, that may not be 100 percent correct, but I can't tell you how many people I've had removed because of that, um, and. Um, um, you know, at any rate, I um, I have a different approach. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Now, there, uh, there's there's um, a case that addresses that particular issue. Uh, it's uh, it's a person related case, and it was a, it was in Alberta Court of Appeal decision where uh, a um, archdiocese in uh, Alberta was being uh, sued as one of the um, um, people or uh, in, institutions. Uh, with regards to a residential school case and their position their application they came to the court and they said hey we shouldn't even be here because we're not a person in law that was the application by this archdiocese and uh, they were found not to be a person in law and therefore were struck were stricken from the complaint so they said hey you know, we're not, we, we don't belong here, but they came to the court and they gave the court the information the court needed to go, yeah, you're right, you don't belong here, you can leave. And that's one of the positions that we can do as private persons, is we have to provide them the information they need to go, yeah, you're right, you don't belong here. So I didn't show that case on here, but that case will be on the, uh, on the uh, page where this is posted, okay? I'm just yeah, gonna... I remember. I remember you talking about that on the, on the webinar. Yeah, and um, and uh, and that's a good point. You know, I, I know sometimes I get carried away. Sometimes I want to make a notice and declaration of war and, and tell them that okay, now you can come <laughs> and murder me, and uh, because that's what you intend to do anyways. You know, um, I, um, I bite my tongue when I do that. But um, uh, at any rate, um, you know, it's it's frustrating. You yeah. Know? Totally. And uh, my goal is to try and stay in peace and honor as much as possible. I have my own frustrations and angry moments, absolutely. Um, but uh, the system is set up that uh, if you stay in honor, uh, they will ultimately go into dishonor and they will, they will end up uh, going away because of it. So, um, yeah, I try and, try and take a slightly different tack. And it's, it's quite a shift. And there's a lot of people, a lot of the freemen in the land movement, uh, have a lot of that anger and, and animosity. A lot of people, as they learn this stuff, go into anger at first. But it's important, I think, to to move past that and figure out how to take your position of power. See, this is the other thing. If you're in a position of power and you know it, you don't have to get mad at them. It's like a child that's misbehaving. You have to set the boundaries, point out the rules, and then invoke the punishment. And the system actually has built within it the punishments. 
So you have to notify the system how the children in the system are breaking the rules and invoke the system's own correction. Uh, and like, you know, how would a king act? He would just say, hey, take care of this. This is wrong. And then somebody would go take care of it. That's what the, that's what the public servants are supposed to be for, be there for. And by the way, a lot of people go public servant, public servant, public servant. Well, there's a difference between public servant and civil servant. And if nobody has an oath of office that's actually sworn, signed, sworn, sealed, and filed, those public offices are not actually being um, inhabited. They're being dealt with or taken care of by somebody who's been assigned to do the job, but there's nobody who's taken an oath to actually hold it at law. So they may not be public servants. They may be just people doing the public servant's job, and therefore they have a different obligation at law. So there's a whole, there's layer upon layer upon layer um, as to how to hold them to account. Um, but I like, uh, I personally, again, the private person aspect. Um, let's see. And what if, what if the judges just don't know this? Well, I was in front of one judge who, like I said, played it fair. They were actually running a court of law, listened to the case matter and uh, made a court order which freaked the crown out um, and they went went to great extent to get uh, to get the uh, case uh, flushed because of that so there are some judges but uh, they get trained on how to deal with it um, yeah do you have special appearances in Canada some people have tried special appearances there is I believe a rule in the Supreme Court British Columbia saying that no there are no special appearances but I don't believe it's necessary um, when you make actually when you make the status uh, issue. Actually, um, it's called a conditional appearance in Canada. Conditional appearance, okay. Right. Um, and that's basically an attendance. That's what you're talking about with an attendance. Correct. Now, my or there's one here that says my orders in Alberta command me to appear, not attend. Well, uh, I would I would suspect that if it's a command to appear. There's already a uh, entity uh, person issue that's been before the court and decided, and that's who they're calling. Is they're calling the 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 uh, the entity. Um, if it uh, if it's not, then maybe something operates differently in Alberta. But in BC, it's, it's commanded in Your Majesty's name to attend. Um, the uh, there's one of them here says to Glenn why did you go to their court if you didn't give them jurisdiction over your person it doesn't make sense well they assaulted me they arrested me they had me in their torture chamber for 24 hours and then they put me in their jail for another four days um, there's one here under martial law can you claim common law actually the judges all wear more than one hat it's it's clearly a martial law jurisdiction, but you can definitely claim common law. Yeah, um, I, I martial martial law is supposed to be a declared condition, I believe. But the, again, for me, uh, they may be playing by martial law rules, but you don't have to consent to it because everything they do indicates they need your consent. They're always asking you to agree. They're always asking you to participate. They're always asking, 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 which means that you have the right to say no. And uh, so again, they may take you there, but you don't have to go. They may again resort to illegal acts in order to get you there. But uh, um, yeah, it's not. Well, they're putting military symbols in the courtroom. I mean, that coat of arms is a military symbol. They're telling you this is a martial law courtroom. Now, now you're you're talking Roman civil law. Well, martial law and Roman civil law are basically the same thing. Uh, yeah, the, I think there's some dis distinctions, but again, it's a, again, for me, it's a moot issue. If I can stay in common law, I don't care Absolutely. how you define what it is, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, that's, that's the, that's the real solution is stay in common law. Yeah. Um, and someone I'll, by the name of Tim Herman has his hand up, by the way. Oh, okay. Well, uh, we'll just leave that for now. Um, will your courses help with the Americans? Because it's all common or related, principally based related, I believe so. The Americans are way down the rabbit hole of, uh, it's scary down there. Um, I'm glad I'm not in the U.S. doing this stuff. So, um, uh, but principally, I believe it's the exact same issue. I would look for private person in your statutes and in your laws and any recognition of it whatsoever. But uh, as it's a common law status, it should be the exact same issues. And with regards to uh, the other two courses, 
the conditional acceptance, honor, dishonor, absolutely. I learned the honor, dishonor from an American, uh, Victoria Joy. And uh, some of you may remember that name. I went searching for her materials like two years ago, and there's nothing. I mean, absolutely nothing anywhere on the internet. Her name is, is just, it's like she doesn't exist. It's just been wiped clean. And uh, it's like, how does that happen? The internet retains everything. So I think they went through and, uh, you know, did a clean out, a vacuum job on uh, all of her stuff. Um, and the only place you can get it is, that I know of is uh, my course. And then there's another course of hers I've got that I haven't even uh, released yet. So um, some of this material they are burying as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, how There's do, a lot of disinformation out there too. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of good people who have learned information from other people who don't necessarily have it quite right. So, so the wrong information gets repeated over and over and over again. And like, you know, a simple thing like spelling versus style. Uh, you know, it's like that needs to be corrected. Uh, it, there, there is a major issue there. And uh, until people correct that, they're going to keep on tripping over it. And it's a simple idea. It's a simple concept. There's no argument about it. There's no discussion, but it should be corrected, right? And uh, there's a lot of issues I would like to see amongst the people educating where we have so many things in common. We don't need to argue about the, about the uh, distinctions or the details. We need to get clear on the principles so that we're all moving in the same direction instead of, you know, cross purposes, fighting each other on um, ideas or structures or whatever. Um, let's see. Yeah, a U.S. question again. It's yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it's all available. Um, the uh, U.S. is a bi-jural state for sure. Absolutely, Louisiana. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, it's it's clearly. I mean, they're doing the same stuff. I mean, why would they, you know, uh, 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 screw up a winning formula? You know, I mean, that's what they've been doing for centuries. Yep. And again, it's in it's every common law. It's the same system, the same process, the same judicial active activity in the courtroom. Again, it's like it worked in one place and they just duplicated it. Um, so there's a question here. Uh, a, Monc a Moncton uh, credit union banned me from their bank for refusing to offer up a driver's license in order to open a private person account. I know the purport they required me to sign. They don't offer this exemption paperwork. CEO asked his staff to escort me out of their offices. I'd love to sue for damages. How's that different than refusing service to a visible minority? Well, I've got a whole case or a whole course already done on opening a private bank account, and I haven't had the motivation to actually finish it and do a webinar. This is the first webinar I've done for quite a while, and it's there's a lot of work, a lot of time, um, and effort that goes into this, and uh, so uh, you know, the bank one I'm going to be asking for a donation on. Uh, in order to you know pay the bills because the ba the bills didn't get paid last month, and uh, <laughs> that's unfortunate. That's the reality for a lot of us guys doing all this research. Um, but uh, um, the bank one again, I think it's I think it's a key issue. The banking, private bank bank account and private business. If we get those two things uh, recognized and respected, we can change a whole lot in this country. And I was one of the people who first did the bank account issue with regards to opening a bank. We're talking early, early uh, 2000s. And when I walked in, they just refused it. And when, I, when they refused it, I says, hey, the Bank Act says you have to provide written refusal. So uh, about a month later, every bank is issuing their written refusals to everybody I was teaching this stuff to. Everybody's got the exact same written refusal, every bank. So, you know, they are coordinating their efforts to shut people down. And it's improper. We need to again. We'll deal with that in the course. That's upcoming. So 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 pay pay uh, pay attention. Get on the mailing list so you get updated when that comes out. Um, there's a question here about if there's an IRS conviction that has matured for ten years, is there a remedy available for prosecutorial misconduct, which will resolve the black mark taboo that wears one one wears? It's my understanding, and there's a couple of teachers out there. Uh, Richard Cornforth is one of them. I think you might even mention it as well, Glenn, that uh, um, every court decision is uh, uh, potentially challengeable and can be overturned um, at any point in the future. And one of the issues is if there's any element of fraud. Fraud is always an action that's available for um, for investigation. So, void judgments. Uh, any, any kind of void judgment. Yeah. yeah. 
So I think you, again, it's a process of telling you. You can attack a void judgment collaterally at any time, at any place. Right. Um, and uh, and if they don't have jurisdiction, then it's a void judgment. It's not voidable. It's just void. And I just filed a notice of void judgment into into this case that I'm involved in. Right. Again, and that's another reason why I really wanted to connect with you, Glenn, was because you're so proactive with paperwork. A lot of people tut, teach stuff and don't follow through. And you're somebody who teaches and follows through. And we need people who have the principles right and follow through with the right processes. And uh, I think you're, you know, the, what you do with some modification is going to be extremely powerful and make a big difference. So I'm looking forward to working with you on getting some actions uh, uh, moving forward. And uh, there's a question here about, uh, I gather that you have a definition example of what honorable means as judges are called the honorable judge. Uh, well, they have their their interpretation of the impression of honor in their system. Because they give themselves the title of honorable, doesn't mean that they live up to it. And it's our job. That, right? It's it's our job to call them on it, evidence when they're not being honorable, and force them to act honorably. And it isn't any different than a teenager or a young child who has to learn the difference between right and wrong. And if they get away with it and get away with it and get away with it, it's okay because nobody's called me on it before. These folks have grown up in a situation and an environment and a culture where it's okay to get away with it because everybody's doing it. We've just seen this with the Senate scandal, scandal in Canada, right? This is what everybody's doing. What's wrong with it? Well, until it's pointed out it's wrong, until somebody's held accountable to it and the standard is reestablished, what we need to do is reestablish the standard of what honorable is. And uh, that's up to us as individuals to uh, take these guys to task for that and say you're not being out. If, if they're walking on you, if they're yelling at you, if they're intimidating you, if they're uh, 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 just taking jurisdiction, doing anything arbitrary, helping the crown, that's none of that's honorable. And, um, and, and again, uh, JD's got a great idea. You just say for on and for, uh, uh, on and for the record. Let the record show that the judge is doing this and the judge is doing that, and 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 I guarantee you that you're going to have something that you can just order the transcript and and you can break it off in their butt. Absolutely, absolutely. I've been in appeal courts, and the courts will you know they'll listen to the person complain from the podium as to what the judge did and 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 so on, and they'll they'll be flipping the transcripts and they're going, transcript doesn't reflect that. That's their only answer. Transcript doesn't reflect that. And so if you didn't put it on the transcript, it never happened. That's why your immediate objection and description of exactly what occurred and how it made you feel is what will reflect in the transcript. And once you do that, the judge is going to be a good boy because uh, you've proven yourself willing and able to stand up to the bullying and it makes them look bad and they don't want to go there. Okay. You, you, in my opinion, I mean, it ruins their careers. You file a complaint against these judges, and and their upward mobility is gone, and uh, and and too many complaints, and they they find out, you know, I've ha I've had judges removed, you know, absolutely, I really have, yep. And and uh, like there was one in Arizona that I filed criminal complaints against him, and he's he's a lawyer now in private practice, and. Um, uh, uh, and the reason I know that is because I was I was in Arizona recently and I saw his law office. <laughs> so so you know I guarantee it it has an effect. Yep, yeah, we need to complain and it needs to be an intelligent, well laid out complaint with evidence. Otherwise, if we have a bunch of frivolous complaints, they're going to shut down people from making complaints because of the frivolous nature. They have to be well drafted, just plain language. It doesn't have to be, you know, lawyer language. Avoid lawyer language. Just put it in plain words. If you were to tell me the story in a calm, cool, collected way without swearing, <laughs> how would yeah, you? How would yeah. you, How would you tell me what happened? Put that on paper and then provide your evidence. That's all you need. <laughs> but, and and that's why I I do the paperwork that I do because because you have to be proactive. You have to. You have to be, uh, take away their presumptions in such a way that they cannot deny that that this didn't go on. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. And so that's why I serve them with a registered letter, and uh, and and I have proof of service, and I I put it all together into a package, and I attach that to my criminal complaint, and uh, and 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 I go through the criminal complaint, and I said I told him this, and then he went and just violated my rights anyways. Right. You know, so he knew exactly what he was doing. 
And if there's behavior complaints, that goes to the judges association, whatever it's called, whatever they're accountable to. And uh, they investigate every one. I've helped people draft them and I've seen the responses. They take them seriously and they have to process each and every one of them. And I've heard that if a lawyer gets four complaints, he has difficulty, if not impossible, to get uh, his insurance, his practice insurance. So how'd you, I, like, to, I know in, how'd you like to cause a few lawyers some problems? I know in Texas that if they get three complaints, then uh, um, they um, they lose their bond. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, and but what happens is is, is that essentially now they're basically uninsured, and because they'll still practice law, I think I'm not positive about this, but uh, once they lose their bond, they're just basically practicing without insurance, if you think about it, and 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 then you try and sue a lawyer, you know, they they know how to protect themselves, you know, so it just you know, I don't know. I don't know how much of an effect that is. Uh, I've talked to some people in Texas about that, and um, and I, I think that's what happens. Well, it's something to investigate for people. I got a question here. Um, it says uh, so basically, the person is a second class citizen with the yoke of slavery, e.g., obligation to pay taxes on earnings, etc. Uh, again, there's a big discussion around that. It's not quite that simple. Uh, if it's a corporate entity of some sort. Uh, that is subject to whatever created it and there's a distinction between a private person and uh, the other types of persons so uh, again you need to do some more research on that um, can a public person be both a private person absolutely you have public per public personas uh, all, all the um, politicians they have a public person that's their office when they're wearing their title and they can also be a private person when they're not wearing their title when they're at home with the kids same thing with a corporate director he's a corporate director when he's doing corporate director work and he's a private person when he's not we switch switch hats all the time all the time and even when you're driving a car here's a quick tip for you guys who like to drive with uh, without a license but are concerned about doing so and I learned this one from somebody a long time ago guy handed over his driver's license and uh, the, a police officer goes, is this you? Pointing at the picture on the license. And the guy goes, no, this is me. And he points at his face. Because they're trying to, the, 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 the officer is trying to claim jurisdiction over the person on the license. He can't claim jurisdiction over you, the human. So, <laughs> and the other way to do it is to hand over the driver's license and say, I'm providing this to you because you demanded it. It's not my property. It says so on the back, and I'm supposed to supposed to give it to to an officer if they demand it. And it is uh, uh, I'm not involved in any commercial activity at the moment. And um, uh, this is only as a proof of competency. And that qualifies every reason why you're giving it to them. I'm not giving it to you as one of your persons. I'm only giving it to you to prove that I that I qualified at a test to drive this car in a safe manner, which is your common law duty. So again, there's all sorts of things that you can do to qualify situations without getting into a big argument or discussion or fight with people. That's not a good place to do it on the side of the road. Um, and you're you're giving them notice there with that type of notice that you're a private person in that moment. You're not acting as a public person, a driver. Um, and that's what that notice is supposed to be about. Will it work? Who knows? But uh, that's the principle behind it. Um, that's actually a good point. Yeah, and it's, that, that, when you go to court, you do it. When you're with the when you're with the police officer, you do it anywhere, anywhere. I'm I'm engaged in private activity, right? Well, and and it's and it's not mine. It belongs to the government. Yeah, it says so right in the back. Property of the issuing agency. And it says you're supposed to surrender on demand. He's demanded it. I'm surrendering it. You going to keep it now? <laughs> Okay, and I'm not involved in commercial activity. I'm only because when I went when I went for a driver's license about well, ten years ago, I went and did my competency test because I was going for a, uh, a, a not just a renewal but uh, a different class of license. You go and you do the road test. They give you a document where you pass your road test, and then you take your document in, and then you apply for your license. The first one is actually your proof of competency, which is fulfilling your duty at common law to prove that you're you know, not going to be a threat to people and property. And then you turn it into a commercial license when you apply for their license. I should have just walked out there with a competency certificate. right? So you say, I'm providing you with this uh, uh, driver's license only as proof of competency because that was what was required to get it. right? Yeah, so it's uh, multiple levels there. Um, 
there's a question here. In Texas, the Constitution states all court, courts are common law courts. Certainly not appeared apparent during the course of events. That's more for you, but um, it, like in, in British Columbia, there seems to be a different as, difference as to where common law courts can exist, as in Perisky's case. He was in a court in Chilliwack, and they actually moved him on the day of trial to a whole different city. And there's reasons for that I alluded to, but they're fully explained in the course. So there must be, in, in BC, limitations as to where a common law court can exist. And I believe it's a provincial jurisdiction versus a federal one. And in BC right now, there's a whole bunch of people being prosecuted for tax evasion. doesn't matter where they are in the lower mainland of Vancouver area. They're all being prosecuted in downtown Vancouver, when normally they would be prosecuted in their local area. And they're moving, getting everybody to travel to downtown Vancouver, which again, I believe is a jurisdictional issue. Um, some thank yous, great presentations, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, always great to hear um, feedback. Uh, in the U.S., the courts are selling the bonds, judgments, which creates a conflict of interest. Absolutely, there's a whole issue with regards to commerce, selling bonds and judgments and bonding things out. I've done research in that area. I have a basic understanding of it in many ways, but it's not my area of expertise or, or full understanding. Um, I've got some people I'm working with here in Vancouver who are into the bond issues and have done some interesting things. Um, I believe I've got a couple things that are dealt with on the website with regards to it, but again, it's kind of like a, a whole other world that uh, I haven't spent enough time on to be speaking to it directly. Um, is there a way to get my case reviewed by either of you for comment and suggestion? I don't know if... Uh, if uh, Glenn is, is open to uh, personal coaching or whatever, I uh, generally don't. Um, I am considering I am considering doing uh, some things with regards to personal coaching calls where if you open up your situation and we use it as a learning opportunity where other people can listen in, because I do a lot of private coaching with people who I've worked with over the years, um, and they're very educational as I walk them through their paperwork, and it would be good teaching opportunity. So, if somebody, if you've got a situation and you want to be used as like a, not a guinea pig, but you know, a case study, uh, you know, that might be uh, considered as well. Um, yeah, um, I was just gonna say something about that comment about Texas and the courts. <clears throat> um, I don't know of any statute in Texas that says the courts are common law. It says the rule of decision is going to be common law, but then there's all sorts of little disclaimers and stuff like legal language that basically says, you know, as as the condition requires or who knows what. I'd have to look at the actual statute, but but uh, and I guarantee you that uh, that all courts are actually ecclesiastical courts because uh, they issue a citation, and if you go into uh, English law dictionaries, uh, a citation is something that comes out of an ecclesiastical court. There's a and, there's a uh, lot of great research around the whole ecclesiastical court issue on Rob Ryder's uh, website. He's, I've studied a lot of his material. I actually went down to the local archdiocese in Vancouver and talked to a judicial vicar to find out about the court process and and the overlap <laughs> and connection and so on. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting information with regards to the overlap between the Catholic uh, system, legal system, and the rest of it. But I think there is a distinction now. There may have not have been as much in the past. They have their own courts in their own buildings. Um, yeah, so there's a whole... And our system is... Uh, they, either, they either copy the same system or, or the system that is presently in use by the powers that be uh, is a duplicate of the uh, ecclesiastical courts. I don't. I don't know if they actually are ecclesiastical courts. They may just copy the process. No, I'm, no, I'm not are. sure who caused. I'm not sure who copied who. Because the bar members are all foreign agents of the Vatican. I mean, by definition, they're ecclesiastical. I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons why they're ecclesiastical. Yeah, a lot of good questions around that. Again, Rob Ryder's been one of the good reasons. There's a couple others. Uh, Santos Bonacci's done a lot of stuff in that area as well. I got a question here. Do I have a driver's license? Yes, I do, and I use it with that particular clarification if I ever have to hand it over. Because I'm involved in other legal issues, I don't need the hassles, and I'm willing to uh, to test with using the using the uh, license with the qualifications. Um, ultimately, I'd like to get rid of it. Don't like having it, but you know, it's an intermediate step. You got to pick your battles. Uh, oh, Absolutely. there's a couple people here who. Um, 
uh, found some Victoria Joy stuff. If you find anything, um, you know, please send it uh, to to my website. There's a contact form. You can send it to info at private-person.com. That's great if you found anything. I only found one file when I searched, and that was like a couple years ago when I did that. Um, how to maintain private person in order to travel internationally, which demands the acquisition and use of a passport. Good question. I've investigated that personally. I was trying to do some international travel and avoid a passport as well. Um, ended up getting some documentation with regards to that. Ended up not using it um, because it wasn't uh, uh, <clears throat> sufficiently proven to me how to use it. So I did use a passport. But I know that there are two levels of passport in the U.S. Um, they have state passports as well as federal. In Canada, I don't know what the second level is, and I am doing personal investigation of that. So I hope to have some course up in the next year based on when I get uh, more info about that. Uh, do you I'd sure like to be find out about state passports because I don't know of any states that do that. Uh, yeah, I've got good research indicating that there is in the U.S. state passports, yes. Yeah, so we can talk about that. Uh, I've seen, uh, I was in Arkansas one time and I saw a uh, Arkansas state vehicle that had red license plate, which tells me that uh, it was a diplomatic plate. Yeah. And it was an Arkansas state vehicle, and uh, I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, we have uh, diplomatic plates here in uh, Canada as well. Um, yeah, so but they're they're international. Are they? They're, they're uh, for, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's for ambassadors a diplomatic plate is for an ambassador or a consul or somebody like that right so do you suggest having a driver's license can't suggest I don't know it's really up to you and your education level and your willingness to deal with stuff I would you suggest, pick, your battles. You pick your battles and I you know <laughs> I wouldn't recommend anybody take any action they aren't prepared to defend all the way to court and if you're not prepared to defend all the way to court then hey uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't risk it. <laughs> but, hey, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> you got to decide exactly. what you want to learn and how you want to learn it. <laughs> yeah. uh, Glenn, there's somebody there uh, that wants to talk to you. Um, um, uh, home run. Home run. Yeah. Um, um, okay. There are people who have done no registration uh, tests here in British Columbia, no insurance, no registration, and no title. Um, it hasn't been properly uh, d documented and, and put into course format like I like to see. So it's not something that uh, I believe there's a, a relatively easy process. But again, everything comes down to defending it. You may be 100% right, but if you don't know how to defend it, you still lose. So um, are you aware if there are common law courts in the province of British Columbia? I would expect there are because it's a common law province. It still has to exist. Uh, and again, the common law, again, my perception is that the private person walking in, claiming that status, claiming common law, determines the court. It's not determined by the judge, it's determined by the parties. In every case, when the parties come before the judge, they inform the judge what type of law he's going to be adjudicating that day. And, you know, it goes from there. So, and be, the common law of private person is the highest form of law. Therefore, as far as I understand, sets the law by claiming that law. Everything is a derivative and and uh, you know built off of common law. Um, can you access common law court of PLBC? I'm not sure because it's a statutory court. The only constitutionally created courts which are of common law that exist in British Columbia are the county court. And the Supreme Court of British Columbia. And that information is covered in the Do Common Law Courts Exist. So I'd encourage you to go through that. Um, great. Another link for Victoria Joy. Um, somebody says to look at the Texas Constitution about common law. Yeah, there's all there is is a, a statute that says that uh, the rule of decision is going to be common law, but <clears throat> it's got lots of uh, little disclaimers and stuff that the lawyers like to put in that kind of stuff. Um, send me an email somebody's got a comment here please contact me about the test or teaching case review please send me an email at uh, info at private-person.com it's the easiest way to deal with uh, that type of stuff Just if you've got a comment or question or suggestion or you want to participate in something send it there have you heard of the, heard of the Embassy of Heaven's driver's license plate? Yeah, I've heard about that stuff, I looked into it um, I have, haven't uh, haven't confirmed it's a good idea or not. So 
Uh, I, I know the guy, that pastor that's been doing that. And um, yeah, the cops will, uh, he's got some very interesting stories to say. He, he deliberately goes 20 clicks over the speed limit just because he wants to make sure the cops know that he's not required to follow their rules. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and the cops will come up beside him and, and wave at him and then point at the speedometer, eh? <laughs> yeah. So then he'll slow down, eh? But, uh, but yeah, he, he uh, you know, yeah, he, he, he's got some real interesting stories. His wife actually was giving him a hard time about, about doing all that stuff, and, and his wife was getting stopped, and he wasn't, eh? So, <laughs> anyways. Yeah, so we're, we just got a couple questions left. It, we've we've almost everybody who's on the call is still with us, which is great. It's been two and a quarter hours. I you know, I don't usually like having things go this long, but the question and answer I think is really valuable for people. So um, you know, congratulations for sticking with it. I just put up a uh, new poll. If you would uh, take a look at the poll and answer the question as to how you feel, um, I I would really hope that uh, people will take the concept of private person and run with it. I don't see this as the final. I just see it as reopening the uh, the uh, the information and the question for further further research, investigation, and testing. Because I really believe it is foundational to the to the entire system in every common law jurisdiction, and will empower everybody to move forward in a good way. Um, but you have to come to that conclusion yourself. The more researchers that research an idea, uh, the more stuff comes to light. The more people who test it, the more stuff that comes to light. I have literally not heard of anybody. And I've, I've followed researchers from every common law country doing this stuff. I've never heard of anybody addressing and teaching private person in its context in common law. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's rife for opportunity for getting more information and more confirmation from people. And I think it's wonderful if people would pick it up and run with it. So, um, okay, we got... Uh, Everybody, we've got 60% voted. I'm going to close it off in 30 seconds. If you haven't voted in the uh, in the poll, geez, it's ticking away, adding up. Going, going once, going twice. It's not American Idol, so, you know. Close, okay, there we go. So I'm going to show the, share the results. Um, so you see the results, 37% have uh, got a good impression of the idea, the potential use of private person, and 3% uh, or maybe. That's a pretty good... Uh, you know, win in terms of opening some eyes, and uh, 3%, I hope you follow up on it, 60% sharing it. Like I said, we need to share um, understandings and clarifications and principles in a way that uh, other people can pick up on it and run with it, and I encourage you to do so. And if any, and if you can please um, give me some feedback, I'm starting to use um, testimonials on the website to let people know the value of the material. So that people will take the time to watch it. You know, we're in the YouTube generation where people will watch something for three minutes and then switch to some other channel or, or whatever. And a lot of the teaching takes 45 minutes, an hour, two hours to go through material properly. So if you feel that this uh, this information and presentation was valid, valuable to you, and worth other people's time to watch it, first of all, I'd recommend you. Um, uh, revisit it when it's on site. Facebook it, Twitter it when you go to visit it because those links will be there. And if you could right now put in your chat box a couple of lines or comments in terms of how you felt this presentation was so I can post the testimonial on the page so people will take the time to watch the whole presentation uh, based on the fact that a, a number of people have recommended it as being very worthwhile. So if you would take a moment and uh, put a couple of lines of text in your chat box if you would about what you think the value of this presentation was, comment in any way you want to about it. And I congratulate everyone for participating, sticking uh, through this information and any other information you're, you're going through. I know it's a long haul. And there's a lot out there. You do sometimes have to sift. I've tried, done my best to sift through stuff and condense, but that doesn't mean that uh, it's the end. So uh, congratulations and encourage you to continue your research and your journey. Do it in a safe, happy, and uh, positive way. And uh, not only will you enjoy the process more, I think you'll get better results. So if you have any comments or any other feedback, uh, feel free to uh, send an email and uh, visit the website for um, updates. And there's a um, you can join a, uh, uh, an email list on the website as well to get notification of new posts and webinar announcements, etc.
Great. Thank you very much. There's some good stuff coming in here. Somebody said the Association of Private Persons. How about it? Well, um, I don't think it's necessary to come together. <laughs> Uh, that's what got me into trouble with my tax evasion case right now is I'm part of uh, identified as part of a group um, but there is the whole idea of an unincorporated uh, private association like a private club that is totally outside of the jurisdiction of uh, all of the um, uh, rules and regulations and statutes and government etc and I believe that is a that is a very powerful tool to use and uh, I've done research in the past and have never followed through with it to the point of teaching it and there's another group I'm working with which is going down that road and uh, I look forward to you know possibly working with them to get more information and figure out how to do it right and keep people keep people out of our private business really it's not that big a concept okay so uh, if you've uh, done your bit with regards to typing thank you so much there's a lot of great feedback there I really appreciate hearing it it's glad to know that uh, it hit home for a lot of you and uh, yes, groups can be private, uh, but they're more easily identifiable by the system in this particular point in time. So again, congratulations. And uh, Glenn, anything else you want to say before we sign off? Uh, no, uh, other than um, I, I think uh, 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 JD's got some uh, really uh, important stuff. And, um, um, and, and I think that uh, this can help a lot of people. Uh, but um, I, I still... Uh, like to be proactive and and serve them with my stuff and and uh, I don't want to wait until it's hearing day and and go in there and and, and get walked all over. I wanna I want to make sure they've had lots of time to look at it and uh, and and what I tell them essentially is that uh, in sometimes uh, I tell them that uh, that uh, they don't have jurisdiction and the more stuff they do to uh, to uh, uh, proceed along this path is just give me evidence. Uh, 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 that uh, I might be able to use against them at some point. Absolutely, I agree 100 percent. The best time to deal with it is privately before court and I believe that avenue is always available to all of us and as a matter of fact court is supposed to be a last resort. We're supposed to do our best to settle in the private, demonstrate they don't have jurisdiction in the private and then they are in dishonor when they actually bring it to court because you've tried to settle in the private and they have failed to do so especially when they've been evidence they they should have so absolutely I agree that settling it before court is the right course unfortunately a lot of people find themselves heading to court <laughs> and have to deal with it there or they've let it lay and that type of thing so yeah I think the best thing is to be proactive and I agree 100% with that with that uh, that process so everybody uh, have a great week and uh, if we don't connect before Christmas have a wonderful Christmas and uh, Again, um, the website's there for, uh, for staying in touch, all right? So take care, everybody, and have a great December. Thanks, J.D. Thanks a lot.